Good morning and welcome to the May 19th public hearing and public meeting. The LPC hearings and meetings have been held in, in Zoom meetings um, since April 21st. And today we are going to try out a new Zoom format to see if it has operational advantages. Instead of using Zoom meetings, we will be using Zoom webinar. The hearing will still be live streamed on YouTube and anyone who wishes to watch the hearing should do so on YouTube. Anyone who wishes to testify on a hearing item should join the Zoom webinar at the estimated time listed on our agenda. We will still display the webinar ID and password information and the phone number at the beginning of each item and at the beginning of the portion of the hearing when we take public testimony. When the public joins the webinar, they will be able to hear and see the proceedings and will not need to follow along on YouTube. And we hope this will make the transitions go more smoothly. After the applicant's presentation, we will ask if there is anyone to testify. If you wish to testify, please raise your hand using the raise hand icon at the bottom of your screen. And we will move you from an attendee to a panelist. When we call your name, you may need to unmute yourself depending on your device's settings. And um, today we will be starting the day with some housekeeping items in research to rescind and or amend landmark sites to reflect current site conditions for three individual landmarks. And then we will be moving on to our preservation agenda. Okay, so with that, I will turn it over to our director of research, Kate Lemos McHale. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, good morning. Item one this morning is LP 0637A, the Beth Hammerdrash Hagadol Synagogue, originally Norfolk Baptist Church, 60 Norfolk Street, AKA 60 to 64 Norfolk Street, Manhattan, Block 346, Lot 37. Item proposed for the commission's calendar is the proposed rescission of the landmark designation consisting of the vacant lot, formerly the site of the Beth Hammerdrash Hagadol Synagogue, also known as Norfolk Street Baptist Church. And presenting this morning is Tim Fry. Oops. Uh, good morning, commissioners. I'm Tim Fry, the director of special projects. Uh, as you're aware, 60 Norfolk Street was vacated in 2007 due to serious structural issues and in 2017 suffered a catastrophic fire that severely damaged the building. This proposal, as Kate mentioned, is to rescind the landmark and the landmark site because the designated building has been demolished. In a series of votes beginning in 2017, LPC eventually approved demolition of the entire site due to hazardous conditions. In its June 2019 vote, to approve the full demolition, the commission found the loss of historic fabric due to the fire, structural issues, and partial demolition of unstable masonry had resulted in a building and site that no longer conveyed significance or integrity as an individual landmark. Because the building has been demolished, this proposal is to rescind the designation of the landmark and the landmark site. The research department recommends that the commission calendar the proposed action for consideration at a, at a future public hearing. Thank you, that concludes my presentation and I'm available for questions. Thank you, Tim. Um, I think many of you are, all of you perhaps are very familiar with this site. Um, unfortunately, there was a, a terrible fire um, and we were carefully reviewing, um, dismantling it with the eye to try to salvage as much as possible. And um, ultimately there was a, a, a collapse during work. And at this point, I think the commissioners have um, approved full demolition recognizing the lack of integrity. So I think you've been to the site, many of you. Um, I think you're very familiar with it, but are there any questions for Tim at this time? Please raise your hand. Okay, so. Um, not seeing any questions, we'll go ahead and make a motion to ca uh, calendar this item. Commissioner Chapin, would you make a motion to calendar this item? Uh, yes, uh, Sarah, did we, did we take attendance? Oh, we did not. We, we, have, we have not taken attendance. <laughs> <I don't. laughs> All right, Rich, why don't you take sure, attendance yes. so that we can take the vote? All right, Chair Carroll. 
Uh, here. Commissioner Bland. Here. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Here. Commissioner Chapin. Here. Commissioner Chen. Here. Commissioner Devonshire. Here. Commissioner Goldblum. Here. Commissioner Gustafson. Commissioner Jefferson. Here. Commissioner Lutfi. Commissioner Holford Smith. Here. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, um, Commissioner Chapin, would you just make a motion to calendar this item? Motion to calendar this item. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Holford Smith, would you second that motion? I second the motion. Okay. All right. All in favor of calendaring the item, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, none opposed. So this item is calendared and we'll hold a hearing in the near future. Okay, <clears throat> item two is LP 0005A, Kingsland Homestead at 143-35 37th Avenue in Queens, block 5275, lots 1, 111, 112, 115, 117, 119, 120, and block 5012, lot 60. Item proposed for the commission's calendar is the proposed amendment to the landmark designation of Kingsland Homestead, which was moved in 1968 to rescind the former landmark site and designate the current location in Weeping Beach Park as the landmark site. And presenting again is Tim Fry. Good morning, commissioners. Again, Tim Fry, department staff. <clears throat> Uh, the Kingsland Homestead is one of the oldest buildings in Queens. The landmark was moved shortly after designation and as Kate mentioned, this proposal is to amend the landmark designation to reflect the current location. Kingsland Homestead was named after Captain Joseph King, the son-in-law of Charles Doherty, who constructed the property around 1785. Kingsland Homestead was designated in 1965 at 4025 155th Street, block 5270, lot 14. In an early decision, LPC approved a certificate of appropriateness, number nine, to relocate the landmark to its current site at 143 37th Avenue, block 5012, lot 60 which is also the site of the landmark of the weeping beech tree. As seen in the photo on the left, the former lot was subdivided into seven lots for the construction of a series of brick row houses in 1970. As Kate mentioned, these lots are block 5275, lots 1, 111, 112, 115, 117, 119, and 120. On the right is a photo of the landmark in its new location where it operates as the headquarters of the Queens Historical Society. It's maintained by NYC Parks, which acquired Weeping Beach Park in 1925 and expanded the park to its current size in 1976. The maps on the right of this slide illustrate the relocation of the Kingsland Homestead. The left map shows the original location of the landmark. The map on the right shows the location of the subject property within Weeping Beach Park. The research department recommends the commission consider at a future public hearing amending the landmark site of Kingsland Homestead to re reflect its current location in Weeping Beach Park. And this concludes my presentation and I'm, I'm available for questions. Thank you, uh, Tim. Are there any questions for Tim? So this is an, you know, an interesting condition where the commission um, designated this property and then issued a certificate of appropriateness for its relocation, but since 1970 never actually um, amended the landmark site to reflect that because the owner is the parks department. We've of course always reviewed permits and applications for this property, but um, we wanna make sure that we get the landmark site accurate and that's why we're proposing this. And I see Commissioner Chapin has a question. Please go ahead. Uh, it's not a question. I realize I should recuse on this item because I am That's the right. board of historic. <laughs> so I'm going to go off the board here. Well. Thank you. 
Yes, and I th think um, we have another recusal as well. Commissioner Goldblum, do you need to recuse? Yes. I'm yes. Do so. And and you'll need to for the next two the next item as well, I believe. Okay. So, um, are, any questions? Okay, so let's, um, uh, Commissioner Lutfi, would you make a motion to calendar this item for a future public hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Devonshire, would you second that? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, Aye. Any opposed? <clears throat> Okay, so um, none opposed and two recused and um, Commissioner Gustafson is not present. He also would have recused. Okay, so we'll move on to the next item now. Okay, item three is LP 0317A, Alexander Hamilton House, AKA The Grange, also known as Hamilton Grange, 414 West 140, First Street in Manhattan, Block 2050, Lot 4, and Block 1957, Lot 140. Item proposed for the Commission's calendar is the proposed amendment to the individual landmark designation of Hamilton Grange, which was moved in 2008 to rescind the former landmark site and designate the current location in St. Nicholas Park as the landmark site. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Thanks, Kate. Uh, again, Tim Fry, department staff. Excuse me. Uh, the Alexander Hamilton House, also known as the Grange, is a federal style house named after the Scottish home of Alexander Hamilton's paternal grandfather. The landmark was moved after designation, and this proposal, as Kate mentioned, is to amend the landmark designation to reflect its current location in St. Nicholas Park. Over the lifetime, the building has been moved three times. In the center of this map is the location where Alexander Hamilton erected the house as a country retreat on 35 acres in 1801. To the left is where in 1889, the house was moved 500 feet and operated as a chapel and later a rectory for the adjacent St. Luke's Church. And the area marked new site at the bottom left is where the National Park Service moved the property in 1998. As seen in these photos at the time of designation on the left and the 1980 tax photo on the right, the front elevation of Hamilton Grange faced the church with the side porch exposed as a street facing out elevation when it was located at 287 Convent Avenue. In 1960, the Department of the Interior designated Hamilton Grange as a National Historic Landmark. In 1966, LPC designated the property as a New York City landmark. And in 1976, Congress passed legislation establishing Hamilton Grange as a national memorial. It was at this time funds were appropriated for its relocation and restoration. In November of 1974, LPC designated the Hamilton Heights Historic District, which includes St. Luke's Church and the former site of the Hamilton Grange. The former lot is indicated by the arrow here on this map. And the amendment before you today only applies to the individual landmark designation highlighted in pink. St. Luke's Church and its entire site remains in the Hamilton Heights Historic District and within LPC's jurisdiction. In 1993, LPC issued a Certificate of Appropriateness approving the schematic proposal to remove Ham move Hamilton Grange from 287 Convent Avenue, Block 2050, Lot 04, to its current site at 414 141st Street, Block 1957, Lot 140 in St. Nicholas Park. The map on the right illustrates the relocation of Hamilton Grange. The red rectangle towards the top of the map shows the original location of the landmark wedged between the apartment building and St. Luke's within the Hamilton Heights Historic District. The lower rectangle near the legend shows the current site of the Hamilton Grange within St. Nicholas Park. 
And the Google image on the left illustrates that through a photograph as well. As seen in these National Park Service photos, the move was completed in 2008. After a complete restoration, the landmark reopened to the public on September 17, 2011. The research department recommends the commission consider at a future public hearing, amending the landmark site of Hamilton Grange to reflect its current location in St. Nicholas Park. And this concludes my presentation and I'm available for questions. Thank you, Tim. Are there any questions for Tim? This is again, another situation where the commission issued a report to allow the relocation and we're just, um, changing the landmark site now to reflect its new location. Um, its previous location remains within the boundaries of the historic district. Okay, so without any questions, why don't we make a motion to calendar and Commissioner Holford-Smith, would you make that motion? And, and, and Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? I'll second it, but I'm trying to raise my hand too and I'm getting- Okay. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Yeah, um, this is such an important house for such an important American. I'm wondering um, what, if anything, like a marker would be on the original, original site. Is there anything at all that marks this extraordinary moment in American history in this house, which was so famously built by this famous American? Is there anything at all to note, for instance, passers-by walking by the, the row houses that are there now, that this was the actual original site of this of the Grange? That's my question, and I'll now lower my hand. And I, I'll let Tim answer that. It's, it's uh, go ahead, Tim. Uh, thank you, um, Chair Carroll. Uh, Commissioner, there's, <clears throat> excuse me, to my understanding, there's no plaque or marker at the original location. However, uh, the National Park Service still maintains uh, a statue at, next to 287 Convent Avenue um, of Alexander Hamilton as that property is still part of, um, uh, of, of a site maintained by the federal government. In the left-hand photo here, you can see the statue that's still located at that 1899 site. Right, uh, right. That's, that's an important site. It was there a long time, but somehow that original, original seems to me to be important. This is not something that we need to deal with today. I'm just kind of expressing the, the hope that a, a group who admire Hamilton might figure out how to arrange a plaque on that site. I think it's, uh, it's just an important thing for, his, for history to, for current people to know about that history. So we, we can move along. Okay, <laughs> and we can certainly talk to the National Park Service about that as well. Okay, so all in favor. Uh, Wait, so we had no second yet because uh, he asked a question. Oh yeah. Uh, I was asked a second, you're right. Counselor, I second <laughs> the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, none opposed. So that is calendared and we'll also hold a hearing for that in the near future. And just, and just so the record's clear, there's no recusals on this. Just so it's clear, this is a federally owned property, so there's no recusals. Okay, thank you, Mark. All right, and so um, thank you, Tim and Kate, and we're now gonna move to the preservation department agenda, and um, it will just take a minute for the um, directors to hand over control of the screen, and we'll go ahead and get started. And, in a, so in a minute, our Director of Preservation, Corey Harala, will start our preservation agenda. Thanks, Sarah. And we do have our applicants, so uh, we're just going to wait a minute, and then I'll read the first item to the record. Okay. <clears throat>
All right, everyone, good morning. Uh, we're gonna start today's preservation department agenda uh, with the public hearing item, item number one. This is LPC 20-040, uh, sorry, 04602, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 1960, lot 25. 412 Clinton Avenue in the Clinton Hill Historic District, a neo-federal style house designed by R.I. Markwith and built in 1919. The application is to construct a rear yard addition, install ramps and railings, and replace windows and roofing. And commissioners, the uh, applicants have joined our webinar and uh, please state your record and uh, state your name for the record and you may begin. And if the applicant could just please uh, unmute yourself. Okay. Good morning, commissioners and guests. My name is Todd Philippi, architect and principal with Church Architects LLC. And with me is the program director of Brooklyn Teen Challenge, Paul Burke. Morning. The proposal we are seeking is to construct a rear yard addition to 412 Clinton Avenue in the Clinton Hill Historic District. Since 1958, this has been the headquarters of Brooklyn Teen Challenge. The addition is necessary to consolidate the operations of Brooklyn Teen Challenge to one location. And to advance the slide, up oh, here we are. You just need to click on the actual presentation itself to advance or you could use the arrow keys as well. Okay. So the blue arrow points to the property's location at the southwest corner of the historic district boundary. Properties immediately to the south and west are not in the district. The property is a through lot with a manor style house facing Clinton Avenue and a carriage house in the back fronting on Vanderbilt Avenue. The aerial photo to the right shows the roof of the manor house and a seven story brick apartment building that is immediately to the south, which is outside of the historic district. On the left is a tax photo from 1940 and it shows the house much the same as it is today. Uh, the tax rolls dated the construction at 1930. Um, I understand from your report that it's dated at 1919, but nevertheless, the appearance and the exterior is fairly much the same. The photo to the right is from 1958 when it was acquired for use as a ministry center, which the program director, Paul Burke, will now tell you a little bit about. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, my name is Paul Burke. I'm the program director for Brooklyn Teen Challenge. Uh, Brooklyn Teen Challenge was founded in 1958 after uh, a man by the name of Reverend uh, David Wilkerson, who was from the hills of Pennsylvania, came uh, to New York to help uh, seven particular boys that were in a, uh, in a, on a murder trial of Michael Farmer as a gang initiation. Um, when he came to the area, uh, he saw that there were many gangs and people addicted to heroin at the time. And uh, he felt led to start a program in, in New York, in Brooklyn. And in 1958, he purchased his house and started the program, which is now called Teen Challenge. Uh, and that program is now in 120 nations, in 1,400 centers uh, around the world, 242 centers in the United States. We are the flagship program of 1400 programs. So uh, not only are we in a historic area, but we're also uh, in a his historic uh, building. Uh, we sold a piece of property up the street last year uh, to be able to do a renovation. 
uh, and expansion. And because we have sold the property up the street, we've lost uh, some, some uh, square footage uh, to run uh, the program. So uh, the expansion is to help with that. And, and, and the monies from the sale was used for a much and will be used for a much needed renovation so that the building will fit the landmark historic area, but also uh, fit the fact that it is a landmark uh, program, a flagship program for 1400 centers around the world. I'd appreciate uh, the time today and thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this is the front view of the house in its context. There is a four story brick house to the right that is also in the historic district, which has been renovated into multiple apartments. The tall brick wall to the left is the seven story apartment building, which is outside of the historic district. Now, this is just a close up of the tax photo to indicate that the exterior of the building, the basic massing, windows, etc., really has not changed over time. The back of the property facing Vanderbilt, there is the carriage house garage, and then there is a driveway to the right of that, which you really can only see the back of the house when the gate is open and you can look up that driveway, but that's a picture standing on the sidewalk looking up the driveway. You'll also notice a large oak tree to the right, which we are planning on preserving. So the existing house is to the right on this, the carriage house to the left, the through lot, and there's about feet between the two buildings of paved concrete. Now looking directly at the back of the house, you can see changes over time, which included a fire escape being added, window sashes that were replaced, window air conditioning units in there, and an entry portico. I want to note that there really is only one authentic window showing in this view, and that's in the bottom right corner with the nine over one mutton style. Now we're looking at views from the back of the property. View number one is looking to the north at the seven story apartment building. And then as we move to view two, we begin to see the carriage house on the right side. View three is standing at the back of the house, looking at the carriage house. View four is looking into the adjacent backyard, which is shared by the multiple apartment residents there. And I would like to point out that in picture one, the location of the basketball backstop is approximately where the back wall of the addition would fall. Our proposed expansion of a little over 20 feet would land right where that basketball backstop is. Now looking to the north at the property to the north and uh, if you'll excuse the splicing, but there were a bunch of obstructions to try and get a continuous picture of the back of, of this building. This is that uh, four story brick house with multiple apartments. And you'll notice there is a one story addition to the back of that house on the left side with a roof deck. And that would be approximately the same distance that our proposal would be coming from the back of the existing building. Looking at comparative site plans, the top being the existing, the bottom being the proposed site plan. And you can see the area that is in gray, the L shaped area in gray is the proposed expansion. And then below that towards the side of the seven story apartment building, we show ramps that are proposed to lead up to the first floor level and a new entrance way in order to make this building accessible because currently it is not accessible at all. 
which has prohibited them from taking in residents that are not fully ambulatory. Comparative floor plans on the left side, the existing cellar and first floor on the right side showing the proposed expansion. And I uh, just want to point out a couple of things here relative to the expansion. On the first floor, the bottom right proposal, you'll notice where the ramps come up on the bottom to a side entryway. This is the accessible entrance way and it provides also an elevator which connects all four stories of the building. Also on the existing cellar, this is where all the, the shower and laundry facilities are located for the residents, which we need to move up to the living floors where they will be. Looking at the second and third floors of the existing, they, it is all sleeping rooms. The proposal for the second and third floor, a good portion of the addition on the second floor is to provide the new bathing facilities, which are again, handicapped accessible. And then on the third floor over the side portion of the addition, we have proposed a roof deck and that is to keep this part of the addition low and subservient to the main addition where we are trying to replicate the existing massing. Showing sections through our proposal, the current front of the building that is facing towards Clinton Avenue and you can see the raised first floor here. And then the proposed addition section on the back of the building. And then if we look at a cut through at section A, that's right here, you can see the roof terrace that is proposed at the third floor. And then you can see the elevator beyond that, which will be lower than the existing parapet and chimneys of the house and will not be visible from a Clinton Avenue at all. Here is a cut through at section BB, which shows the addition of the elevator and the raised entry on the side of the building to provide handicapped access. This is a comparative overhead axonometric view of the existing building on the left. And you can see to the property to the left, which is within the historic district, that one story addition with roof deck. And then our proposed expansion where we would be pushing out the back of the building essentially at 20 and a half feet, maintaining the same profile, putting in historic profile windows in that location, and then keeping the side that is being infilled with the roof deck at a lower elevation to keep subservient to the main massing of the addition, which replicates the existing. And then rear elevations, looking at the two views in context, top existing, bottom being the proposal. And then looking from the back to see how it appears now in the two photos on the top. And then once this addition would be constructed, what would be visible of it and how it would appear from Vanderbilt Avenue. Um, on the left side, there's a significant amount of vegetative growth. So it's been removed in the model on the lower left and on the right side, the gate is not shown and the oak tree is not shown uh, right bottom. Uh, that's just been removed to be able to give you a view of the back of the building and what would be seen from Vanderbilt when that gate would be open. Then looking from Clinton Avenue, the top photos being the existing view down 
the sides of the house on the left side where the tall apartment building is. Uh, you, you really can see virtually nothing of the back of the building. The comparative model view just below that, again, the addition will really not be visible from Clinton Avenue. And then on the right side of it, again, there's a lot of vegetative growth trees between the two properties and they've been removed on the bottom right view just to show uh, the existing house, which you may recall from the historic photo, and then the 20 foot extension beyond that. So the proposal um, for the materials, we would be facing the, the building in brick to match the existing. You can see on the right side and I've removed the tall building from the, uh, the view where the ramps are proposed to come up from the front and the back of the property to a new side entrance way to make that accessible. And then where there's a recess up here for the elevator, we just put a balcony railing there to mount what we have in the front of the building and the portico, the existing and the rails that would be high up here, uh, all made out of wrought iron. And again, the windows we I'll show you some details of that. We're looking for to use a historic profile on that. And then we would be using the uh, siding material to match the existing dormers and a roofing material, which again, I'll show you in detail in just a moment. So uh, again, assessing the impact of the side addition, it virtually will not be, the side infill will not be visible from Clinton Avenue. And to give two different views of where that side infill would occur, uh, the view on the right is a photo at ground level where we're looking at the area that would be infilled with the elevator and the ramp entrance way. Although of course there's a shed in the way of being able to see the full view of that alley. But then looking overhead, this is the area for the proposed infill on the side to connect to the rear addition, but the elevator tower being located here, and then the second, uh, the third floor roof deck being in this location here. And then finally, we're also looking to restore the original house, replace all the windows with new solid wood aluminum clad windows, um, replace the slate roofing with a slate appearance material, which I'll show you in a moment, uh, replace the shutters with correct solid panel shutters on the bottom and then louvered shutters on the top that would also be sized correctly to the width of the windows and have historic uh, hardware put on them as well. And then the balance of the front would just be uh, restored and painted, including the cornice work and gutters and the portico. Showing the original windows on the left, which were nine over one uh, in the mutton configuration. And the dormers we presume had four over one. The right side shows the condition of the windows that have been replaced or repaired or capped over time and so they would be totally replaced. Uh, this is the window that we are proposing to use. It is a, uh, it's a top of the line window, Ply Gem Mira series. It's solid wood with bonded aluminum. And then the roofing material that we are proposing is Echo Star Majestic Slate, and it is an ear based company containing 80% recycled material and it has a 50 year warranty. You can see the appearance in the upper left in an installation and the an actual piece of the slate on the bottom right. And then uh, with my fingers, you can see the thickness of this material. Uh, one of the, the, it's a lower maintenance than real slate is it's significantly less costly and there's also less weight that would be uh, being put onto the roof structure as well. 
so we we've sought to create an addition that was an extension of the existing architecture to the greatest extent possible while meeting the needs of the ministry for more space and to bring the construction of the building up to current building requirements for accessibility life safety and energy okay so thank now we'll you open it to questions Thank you very much. That was a, a very clear presentation. Commissioners, do we have any questions for the applicant at this time? Okay, Commissioner Chapin, please go ahead. Uh, would it be possible uh, to, uh, with an additional gate in the um, fence in the front, to have a straight run for the accessible entrance from the front? Um, yes, I think we could get, I'm gonna go back to the slide commissioner of the site plan. Yeah. Go back two more. Yeah, I didn't know if you had the elevation, you know, uh, at the grade that you needed. Right. What, what we had proposed to do with the ramp, and you can see in the bottom right here, right. the ramp going to the front was we were going to have one turn in it, and then we were going to lower, remove the curb at the fence, the existing opening, right. and have a new sidewalk slope down to bring it to sidewalk level. So that, this is what we, we had proposed to modify to allow the entrance from the curb to be, um, to make that fully accessible. And so what would be involved if you were to have it go straight to the sidewalk, a removal of a fence and do you, would you be able to have the appropriate slope? That's, that's a question I'm, I, I would have to look at in a little bit more detail to see what our grade okay. differential is there. I think we would because the curb, that's, we would have about 12 feet in there. So it, it may be a matter of extending the ramp itself, uh, possibly another six feet. And then we could have just a sloped sidewalk and a new curb opening and a, a gate put in there. So I think we could do that, yes. Is that a hey. historic fence? Perhaps perhaps we should look at a it's photo. Iron the fence, we'll go to the elevation, uh, the photo view. Okay, got it. Oh, go back. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, so it's an iron fence and we could certainly modify that to be able to provide a, a gate on that side. Okay. All right, thank you. Other thank questions? You. Commissioner Jefferson, please go ahead. Yes, on, on the back facade, if you could show the elevation of that, the existing. I think the back facade is symmetrical the existing facade is symmetrical. If you can go to your proposed facade. This is fine. Um, I think the, the symmetrical facade is very powerful. So I'm, I'm asking whether you could push the rectilinear volume back a foot or two to uh, emphasize the, the front facade as a symmetrical composition. Just like you have in the original. Mm -hmm. So just push it back to the prominence of that facade, with the sym symmetry of that facade would be dominant. Right. Um, I, I think we could get at least a six inch relief there. I could try for a foot, but um, we've, designed it extremely tight with a, a fire stair that is in that corner. Um, so I would just have to assess the impact, but I know we could get six inches. We could try for 12 inches. 
Okay, thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Goldblum. Hi, um, I was wondering about the front facade and the decision to uh, replicate and reinstall the, the shutters. Um, is, it the, is it your opinion and the staff's opinion that shutters were uh, significant um, aspects of the original design? Uh, the, the tax photo doesn't show them. I'm going back to the tax photo now, and, and it actually does show them, but they're painted black. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. All right, good. All right, never mind then. So that uh, that was our proposal was to replicate the original shutters. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Okay, so why don't we see if there's public testimony at this time? And I'm gonna turn it over to our executive director, Lisa Kersavich, to see if we have anyone here to speak. And if you're in, in uh, if you've entered the meeting and you would like to speak, please raise your hand so that we can identify you. Yes, and nobody signed up to speak for this item. And I don't see any raised hands. Okay. So I believe that's it for the testimony. Okay. And Rich, do we have any written testimony or a resolution from the community board? Yes, we do have a resolution from Brooklyn Community Board 2 recommending approval. I'm sorry, what? We have a resolution from Community Board 2 recommending approval. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, so um, any uh, final questions for the applicant? All right, not seeing any hands. I think that we can go ahead and make a motion to close the hearing and begin our discussion. So Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you make that motion? Moved. And Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? So second. Okay, all in favor of uh, closing the hearing? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. And if we could maybe um, move to maybe the axonometric slide while we're discussing it. So this is a proposal for a rear extension to accommodate a use that's been at this building for a long time. And um, it is sort of extruding the, the rear existing rear extension further out and then wrapping. Um, but at a lower height to preserve a reading of the original volume. And um, it also uh, includes, of course, the accessibility ramp, the replacement of modern windows with new aluminum clad wood windows that would match the historic configuration, and the replacement of the roof with the EcoStar um, uh, slate replica roof shingles. Um, so with that, um, and understanding those are sort of the three components that we need to discuss. Um, why don't we go around and have our discussion? And um, and I also do want to just note that the as the applicant presented, the rear facade is visible only really when that gate is open oh, okay. at the garage that yeah. faces the street behind um, and does align with the extension on the adjacent house within the district. Um, so why don't we start at, um, we'll start at the top of the table with Commissioner Goldblum. Okay. Um, no, thank you. I think that um, the proposal is generally uh, fine. I think that the suggestions that have been made so far are great suggestions. Yours uh, in regards to the ramp uh, going straight to its own gate uh, on Clinton. I think that's much better in terms of preserving the front yard of this house, uh, which I think is very much part of the design. I think that the that uh, Commissioner Jefferson's comments about setting back that bay, kind of the asymmetrical bay, but since it is visible in some conditions in the street, and since it is a designed facade, it's not your typical back of brownstone kind of situation. Um, I think it's good to try to retain that sense of Symmetry. I personally think that the six inch uh, setback would be acceptable. 
uh, if the applicant can make it bigger, that would be great. <laughs> the only thing I would suggest is that, again, working with staff, if it was possible to modify that same area that they're setting back in some way to accommodate the reinstallation of that portico that's there now, or the replication of that portico, um, since it was, again, a aesthetic element of the facade that was designed, um, I would suggest they try it with staff, but I don't think it's essential. Generally, the Echo Star uh, roof is, is uh, acceptable. We, we, we talked about it last week. Um, I think it's a, a very good substitute uh, for a uh, slate. Um, I think that the uh, windows are appropriate. Um, and uh, that's about it. I think okay. you know, I, the only thing I would say is that they, the applicant, when you're doing this kind of brick match, Job, it's very important that the applicant work closely with staff to make sure that the bond, material, the brick, and the grout are good matches for the existing. Okay, great. Commissioner Chapin. <clears throat> Sorry. See, I uh, do also think that the uh, straight run for the um, uh, accessible uh, entrance is uh, preferable, and I agree with uh, Commissioner Jefferson's comments. I didn't hear all of um, uh, Commissioner Goldblum's comments because I had to uh, answer something. Anyway, um, I think in general that this is uh, sensitive and appropriate uh, with uh, a couple of uh, minor revisions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Holford Smith. Uh, I agree with a lot of what has already been said. Mm -hmm. I think um, Commissioner Jefferson's suggestion of emphasizing the symmetry of the back facade is, is a really good one because it, it is a very highly designed rear facade. Um, and it would be very nice to bring back that portico if possible uh, at the new entry door at that back elevation. Um, I differ from uh, previous comments though on the handicap ramp. Um, when you look at the front of the building, there are two openings in the existing gate that are symmetrical about the entrance. And the applicant is using one of those to, um, to create the path to the uh, accessible route. And I think that adding a third opening in that fence is, is, is excessive. Um, and I think what they've done actually is fairly sensitive by keeping that gate um, and sort of using the similar route that they have now going to the back. So that would be my only, only difference of opinion. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes, I will agree with um, Commissioner Holford Smith about that entry condition. Um, and additionally, I think the slate roof is uh, a very important aspect of this building and I am opposed to replacing it with any uh, replacement material. I think it should be slate. <clears throat> okay, Commissioner Jefferson. Um, I agree with the comments of my fellow commissioners. <laughs> okay, so uh, I know the suggestion to set that one bay back on the rear, um, you know, up to six inches if that's possible or if they'll explore further. Um, on the ramp, did you feel that it should go straight to minimize its impact on the front yard or to be um, to turn as is currently proposed to minimize the impact on the fence? Oh, that's my question. Oh. That's for me? Yes. Ah, yeah, oh, it would be great if I, we could have an opinion on the, the ramp. I, 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 I would prefer to see the, the central, the, the entry, uh, if you go to the plan, a second. You see, I, I would rather see the, the entry, the front entry, you just keep that same path and then turn. So you only have one entrance, but the, okay. rather than- Rather than uh, a third entrance, okay. Uh, yeah, but I would accept too, if, it's, if it makes sense in terms of the run of the ramp. You know, if it's the difficulty in, in getting the one in 12 slope. Okay. 
And are you comfortable with the EcoStar material on the roof and the um, aluminum cladwood wood windows? I, 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 uh, I'm fine with that, yes. Okay. Commissioner Lutfi? Um, I agree with, uh, all, I mean, many of the comments. And I do wanna say again that I, I think this has been very thoughtfully done and I appreciate the applicants wanting to, as much as possible, even in putting, creating this addition, trying to maintain the original lines of the building and using uh, materials that are compatible with the original materials. And um, I, I think from a visibility standpoint, it's really not that visible. Uh, and I think it's, it's gonna fit in very well with uh, the surrounding neighborhood. I, I think the suggestions about the setback, whatever is possible, make a lot of sense. And I'm fine with the roof material. And I think that uh, if possible, one entrance through the fence to the ramp would make, what well, one entrance to the fence, through the fence on the side in terms of the ramp makes sense. Okay, so as proposed. Okay. And Commissioner Bland. Um, I thought it was an exemplary um, proposal and presentation, graphics, and the verbal presentation was really excellent. It was so clear. Thank you for that. Um, I'm in agreement uh, with the setback being proposed by Commissioner Jefferson. I think that was a good suggestion. Six inches is fine. If you can get a little bit more, that's even slightly better, but not necessary. Uh, the roof material is fine as presented, and I'm sort of of the... Uh, um, don't add a gate. I, th I think you can um, in enter through the, the, the main gate. Okay. Commissioner Chen. Yeah. Commissioner Jefferson and Commissioner Bland, I think it's a very nicely done proposal. Um, I, I, um, I have no problem with the, uh, the replacement material for the uh, slate. Uh, I think other commission have commented before that it's time tested and time proven. Uh, I um, I also agree with Commissioner Blinn to the, um, you know, I like the Jefferson, uh, Commissioner Jefferson's suggestion about setting it back to see if, it's, if it can be done at one foot. If not, six inches is fine. And I do think that if we can maintain without any further disturbance on what Commissioner Blinn just talked about, you know, the, the gate issue. Okay. And Commissioner Devonshire. Sir, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, everyone is having this issue. I'm having a technical issue here where I only hear about half of what people are saying. It cuts out and oh. sounds like it's in an echo chamber a lot. It might be uh, might be my system in which case I'll move next week. But in case, I've only heard about half of what people are saying. But um, I agree with Commissioner Jefferson's comment about the setback. I also, uh, I'm okay with the windows on the roof, and I think that the, um, the front access ramp is uh, okay as presented. Okay, all right, and I'm sorry you're having difficulty. I can hear when you're speaking, you're breaking up, so I wonder if it's a, a Wi-Fi issue on your end, um, but I, I do appreciate your covering all the aspects. Commissioner Goldman. I'll, I'll try and move my position in the house. Okay, Before great. Them. Thanks. All right, Commissioner Goldblum, I think that you wanted to add something. I was going to suggest that if um, that uh, to me, what was objectionable about the ramp in the front was that it kind of steps on the, the lawn and kind of disturbs the symmetry of the, of the way the house is perceived from the street. I think that if everyone's um, uh, feeling that the, the cutting of a new gate's a bad idea, maybe they could explore with staff moving the ramp pathway closer to the fence so that it didn't uh, intrude as much on the existing pathway and lawn kind of figure of the lawn. Um, right now it kind of steps on it in a, in a way that I think is, you know, is uh, more impactful on the lawn, on the front appearance of the house than it need be. Uh, I think that if they were to keep the 
walkway of the ramp closer to the fence, it would leave more lawn and that could be worked on with staff. Okay. And I think Commissioner Bland wanted to add something. I, I, it's another question. Uh, is that a one in 20 or is it a one in 12 ramp? A one in 20 does not need handrails, which would make, and if it's one in 12, it'll need a handrail, which is much more intrusive. Would you like me to answer? Um, no, actually, it, I think the, um, Maybe sorry. Cool. Yeah, if Corey can answer, if not, it's something that we can continue to talk to the applicant about afterwards. Yes, fine. Yeah, the, the ramp to the side of the house, the long extended run that goes up and then down towards the back is a one in 12 that would need the railing, but perhaps the one in the front is the shallower version that doesn't need the railings and we could work with the architect to make adjustments. Yeah, I would hope that a rail in the front would, could, could really be avoided. That, that would be a huge intrusion, I think. <clears throat> Okay, so I think that we have um, enough votes to approve this proposal with the modification that um, that the side bay at the rear be set back to the extent feasible to allow a, a, a reading of the symmetry of the rear facade. And I think we'll encourage the app. I think we actually have enough votes for the ramp as proposed, but we'll encourage the applicant to continue to think about how to minimize the railings and integrate it into the landscaping. So I'll go ahead and make that motion and then we'll call the vote and see where we are. So um, this is an application for a certificate of appropriateness Borough of Brooklyn, docket number LPC 20046024412 Clinton Avenue in the Clinton Hill Historic District, block 1960, lot 25, a neo-federal style house designed by R.I. Markwith and built in 1919. This is an application to construct a rear yard addition, install ramps and replace the windows and roofing. Um, and I note that the building style scale materials and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Clinton Hill Historic District. I also note that a um, residential drug and alcohol program has been located at the building since 1958. I recommend approval with modifications that the proposed work will facilitate the continued use of this historic structure as a community facility as it adapts to its growing needs that the rear facade of the existing extension is simply designed, therefore its removal will not eliminate any significant architectural features, that the rear addition will be minimally visible at oblique angles in the context of the front facade when viewed from public thoroughfares along Clinton Avenue, that the addition and the bulkhead will be seen in the context of larger adjacent buildings from limited vantage points when viewed from public thoroughfares along Vanderbilt Avenue, that the massing of the addition at the upper floor will be set back from the south facade of the main block of the building, helping to maintain a sense of the building's original massing, that the addition will not substan substantially eliminate the presence of a rear yard or overwhelm this through block lot, that the design and materiality of the proposed addition matching the height of the existing extension featuring red brick cladding and a Flemish bond and punched openings will be harmonious with the building and with the historic district. That, the, um, that a removal of a limited portion of the modern fence and concrete curb at the front yard would not eliminate a significant feature from the site or the streetscape that um, the proposed barrier-free access ramps at the side yard featuring metal surfaces and railings will accommodate barrier-free access in, an, in the least obtrusive manner possible, and that the proposed windows will match the historic windows in terms of configuration, operation, details, and finish, and the change in material from wood to metal clad wood would not be perceptible when viewed from the public thoroughfare, and that the pro proposed synthetic slate shingles will closely match the size, pattern, color, and texture of the original slate roofing, which is in a deteriorated condition warranting its replacement. However, I recommend that the um, southern bay of the rear extension be set back um, to the extent possible at least six inches from the rest of the rear facade to maintain a reading of symmetry on the rear facade and um, and I'm also would encourage the applicant to explore um, landscaping and 
uh, slope changes to minimize the presence of the ramp in the front yard. And can we have a second on that motion? Second. All in, uh, sorry, Rich, go ahead and call the vote. Yes, Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. Okay, with 10 in favor and none opposed, the motion carries. All right, thank you all and good luck. And we'll move on to the next item. Okay, the next item is number two. This is LPC 20 09886. An application for a binding report in the borough of Brooklyn, block 25, lot 12, 11 Water Street, Brooklyn Bridge Individual Landmark, also in the Fulton Ferry Historic District. A park constructed from former waterfront industrial sites and from portions of the former Fulton Ferry Park. The application is to alter and expand the existing park. And commissioners, the applicants have joined the webinar. And applicant, if you would state your name for the record and you may begin, thank you. Thank you, good morning. My name is Eric Landau. I'm president of Brooklyn Bridge Park um, and am joined by Paul Seck, a uh, principal at Michael Van Valkenburg and Associates, our, uh, who is our landscape architecture firm and Lindsay Ross, our director of capital uh, projects and restoration. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to present uh, before you this morning on the final piece of Brooklyn Bridge Park to be developed. Um, as the commission knows, Brooklyn Bridge Park began construction in 2008 and has been opening up um, portions of the 85 acre park in phases. Um, and we are pleased to show you what we commonly refer to as the Brooklyn Bridge Plaza, which is the space directly underneath the Brooklyn Bridge. You can see it outlined here as project area. Um, you know, originally this actually was going to be the first park project um, phase of the park to be developed. Um, and then when the city received some economic stimulus money in 2008 for restoration of the bridge itself, uh, New York City DOT asked us to work on other areas of Brooklyn Bridge Park and then come back to this area when they were done. That work has obviously now been completed and what was to be the first piece of Brooklyn Bridge Park, we're now pleased to present to you as the final piece of uh, the original Brooklyn Bridge Park. Um, so just putting it in the context of the Fulton Ferry Historic District, um, obviously you can see the project area in the larger historic district boundary. Um, and some historic photos um, of the space. Um, uh, this is circa 1970. We wanted to specifically point out the purchase building, which uh, is no longer there, which was directly underneath the bridge, and the smokestack building, which is still there and in fact now operates as a park concession. Uh, the, some close-ups of the purchase building itself, again, directly under the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, and in 2008, working with this commission, we received approval as sort of the first step of this project uh, to open up this space and to open up the views um, was the demolition of the purchase building. Uh, again, that, uh, that approval came from LPC in 2008. And this was sort of our original plan with the removal of the purchase building on the left and then on the right, the what we originally saw as sort of early drafts of um, of this project. Uh, and you can see the smokestack building uh, there on the right um, uh, in the original plan. Uh, that's not the only time we've had the pleasure of working with LPC in this area. Uh, in 2008, we also received approval to uh, realign the Water Street sidewalk and actually um, extend and enlarge the sidewalk um, and to as part of the park project. Um, you can see, uh, see that here. Uh, we've also worked with LPC in 2014 on some work on J Street, uh, as well as most recently this past year doing uh, uh, a concession approval uh, for uh, Fulton Ferry Landing. 
Um, so uh, quickly, you know, the existing conditions of the site itself, uh, the space directly under the bridge, our project is also going to include doing some work, um, regrading and uh, reconfiguring the Empire Fulton Ferry lawn, not changing its size, but changing its shape and orientation. A huge piece of this project is about circulation and connectivity from one end of the park to the other. Currently, if you are in the Dumbo section of the park, uh, say by Main Street at the bottom of this image, and you want to make it to Pier 1, um, as you reach the bridge itself, you actually have to exit the park um, and walk along Water Street and just the Water Street sidewalk in order to reach Pier 1, or vice versa if you're going from Pier 1 into the Dumbo section. Um, and that sidewalk on Water Street, especially during the height of the summer, that's pretty narrow and congested. And in a time period, obviously, where we are focused on um, uh, social distancing and creating more space, this project couldn't come at a better opportunity. Because what it will do in effect, as you can see here, is it will open up the entire plaza um, and allow for lots of connectivity. Um, and as we like to talk about in the office, really open up significant release valves of, um, of pedestrian traffic. We have a, a number of uh, existing photos that I'll run through quickly. Um, this shows uh, going towards Pier 1 and Fulton Ferry Landing. You can also see here the, um, the extension of that sidewalk that uh, LPC approved. Uh, looking uh, the other direction, you can see the uh, historic fireboat station, Fulton Ferry Landing, um, and then you can start to see, uh, if you look down, say, example, at, at picture number four, the bottom right corner, you can see that that sidewalk along Water Street. And as I said, while this project has not yet been built out, you can see the construction fence that closes it off on the left, and that sidewalk becomes the only pedestrian access point current. Uh, a photo directly under the bridge itself, looking at the bridge abutment. Um, it's a large open area. I do want to point out uh, towards the abutment itself of the bridge, um, those bollards um, and behind the bollards is a wrought iron fence. Um, all that have been approved previously by LPC, that work was completed by DOT and that area um, around the abutment is actually a DOT controlled space, whereas the rest of the plaza is under park control. Um, and what this photo also shows is, you know, there, and uh, Paul Sec will get into the design details in just a moment, uh, but there have been some interesting design constraints with this project, all related to the bridge and the bridge abutment, um, and that we've had to do things to, from a Homeland Security perspective, to design elements like those bollards that DOT has done and some other things to ensure protection of the bridge, uh, the base of the bridge itself. Um, as well as create opportunities if New York City DOT needs to come in and be able to access the bridge for uh, routine regular maintenance. Another vantage point of the space looking towards St. Anne's Warehouse and the Manhattan Bridge. Uh, Fulton Ferry Lawn, which I said uh, we will be uh, regrading and reconfiguring as part of this project. Here's an existing photo of that. And then just a, a quick bird's eye view uh, of the existing condition uh, of the space, uh, followed by uh, a bird's eye view rendering of the same space of what we are about to show. Uh, and with that, I hand it over to Paul Seth, who will walk you through the specific design. Paul? Thank you. Um, uh, thanks for um, having us. I just wanted to um, sort of reemphasize the point that Eric made where um, this is one of the most interesting parts of the um, park. It bends right here um, at the Brooklyn Bridge. So this physical and visual access that's being opened up here to connect the park is uh, huge and a great moment to finishing the project. Um, um, the next image shows um, some of those major, um, I don't know, Lindsay, if you could advance the next. Some of those major circulation uh, points that are key, I think, uh, to Eric's point of not pushing people out on Water Street, opening up better access uh, from all ends. Um, there's also significant opening up and um, of, of the of the Brooklyn Bridge 
visually, um, not only the deck, not only the pier itself, but the immensity of it and being underneath it. So this opening up of this space um, has a great visual um, and physical uh, connection between the two. Um, the existing site has um, many different elements of materials going on right now. We'd really like to turn this into a more cohesive plaza design. We have some cobbles underneath the bridge. We have wood out um, on the old state park portion of it. We have some asphalt, some concrete. And the next image really shows us wanting to make a cohesive uh, ground plane that moves its way um, through the park from one end to the other. We are uh, editing the cobble around the Brooklyn Bridge abutment to make a stronger, more uh, geometric uh, landing for the Brooklyn Bridge while also adding um, uh, accessibility on um, the water side of the bridge abutment. The existing cobbles are not ADA accessible, so um, allowing all folks to get out onto the water's edge and really uh, tying this all together while um, connecting it to other uh, materiality that runs through the rest of the park um, from Atlantic Avenue all the way over to J Street. So this is a great opportunity for us to uh, pull all that together. Uh, the design uh, inspiration really, um, uh, as we've thought about it, had many um, aspects. There was the technical aspect of uh, creating a secure space uh, for DOT and Homeland Security. Uh, concerns, and there's also a moment to celebrate uh, a place that has not been open for a very long time and really wanting to um, celebrate the bridge, not only the abutment, but the deck as it runs through. So we have this concrete unit uh, paver that is still uh, um, of an industrial feel. It's, it is more um, rough and tumble uh, like a like a cobble but it is actually accessible and we're playing off of the next image which is the um, deck that runs above and how that structure uh, can mirror itself down on um, uh, the paving uh, and and and, get, and guide the eye towards the bridge but also um, allow that accessibility of moving uh, you, you know in the other directions through the plaza and giving a moment of uh, pause so that you can um, understand the deck above and um, really um, create uh, something special while still having it feel um, like it's part of this uh, industrial and um, historic plaza in this area. So next image, um, this is another opportunity to make a more cohesive materiality um, change that was there. So we have the blue tinted concrete that runs through Dumbo and our current edge condition up to the curb is chip and seal pavement. And we'd like to take that uh, concrete uh, from Dumbo and run it all the way through this part of the park. So that again, uh, an area that has had a lot of different um, materials and usage uses um, is being pulled together uh, more comprehensively. Uh, the planting, um, so the three planting beds that you see along Water Street work not only technically, but from a design standpoint. Technically, they are providing uh, security as we're sloping them up a couple of feet and getting us that uh, vehicular barrier um, there. But the technical aspect is only part of it. What we like about this is that as you're moving along Water Street, you could actually move um, into this space and under, and be and be you know facing the Brooklyn Bridge um, pier, seeing the paving running up against it, and you're being held in that space by the planting behind you. It works uh, from a massing standpoint to hold people in that area, but it also still allows the porosity that we need for for movement through this area. So it's a it's higher trees with a lower um, uh, ground cover. Uh, that still allows visual access into it, but as you move into that space, you're you're being held by more landscape and um, you know not uh, being along uh, a road, but being more in a plaza that we're uh, creating here. Uh, we have 
uh, our typical park benches and salvaged granite that we've used throughout the park uh, that we're uh, going to be using in the same way. Uh, next, our um, the purchase building lentil has been salvaged and we'll have that um, uh, uh, as you walk along Water Street that you'll be able to view. Um, there are existing bollards, as Eric mentioned, um, underneath and uh, next to the Brooklyn Bridge uh, pier itself, um, but the park has taken on, um, I think, a great uh, additional initiative uh, to create a, a bollard edge to restrict vehicular access in these areas. There will be um, bollard, um, removable bollard access for the maintenance uh, of the park and also for DOT access, uh, but pulling those bollards along that edge and in places where we can use the planting to reduce the bollard numbers, uh, we're doing so. So this is creating a, a secure edge um, along this part of the park. Lighting. Uh, our lighting uh, is similar in this area as it is through the remaining portion of the park. Taller poles, creating moonlighting, uh, having uh, uh, not just the paths lit, but all of the landscape so that it's uh, more visually accessible and comfortable. Uh, the one piece that we're looking at that would be a little different is um, uh, two poles at the base um, uh, of the bridge that would wash that indentation of the pier itself uh, moving, um, as you can see in that upper right hand image. Um, and the rest, but the rest of the lighting is really meant to uh, uh, be uh, congruent with the rest of the Brooklyn Bridge Park. Uh, last two images, again, this is existing um, Condition, condition photo that we see today. We've got the fence that's running around there visually blocked and the next image shows a rendering of uh, uh, what we're proposing and planning in uh, the park. So thank you very much. And just a, a very quick word on schedule. So all the commissioners know uh, our plan is uh, obviously uh, once we have approval uh, to move forward with procurement through this summer and early fall with the hope of breaking ground um, late fall um, and completing the project a year later. So looking at a, a completion ribbon cutting sometime in December of 2021. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for a clear presentation. We have a number of questions. So I'm gonna um, go ahead and take questions now from the commissioners and we'll start with Commissioner Goldblum. Um, I wanted to just ask you about the uh, planting at the foot of Fulton Street. Uh, it looks like you're adding a few areas of like small droplets of green at the at uh, near the near the ferry landing. Um, am I seeing that right? There's some green green in that area that's being introduced. <laughs> Those four islands around the ferry landing area. Um, can you just uh, help me understand the historic, the interplay between the, 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 the uh, proposed green in that area and the historic condition of that particular part of uh, the park? Uh, so uh, let me start, but Lindsay and Paul, fee please feel free to jump in. The planting that, uh, that, uh, that Lindsay is circling around that I think your question is aimed at is actually existing planting. Um, that's that's been there. The new planting that will be um, added as part of this project is where the the hand is now moving around. Those are the planting beds uh, that uh, Paul described, and um, some of those are aesthetic. Others of those are from a homeland security perspective to break up the number of bollards that we would need to use. Uh, but the planting that you're asking me about, Fulton Ferry Landing, is uh, existing. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner. All right. Commissioner Bland. Thank you. Um, Paul or Eric, either one, uh, it, it, I was a little unclear. Is it, is it gonna be able, uh, is it gonna be possible to walk all the way around the Brooklyn Bridge Pier or will you be cut off at some point? Yeah, right there. Yes, yeah, so you will be able to walk completely around the abutment. Um, Lindsay, if you would, with your 
um, with your mouse. Uh, there is both a DOT bollard line that Lin Lindsay, if you would show the bollard line, the bollard line is accessible. You can pass the bollard line, um, but then there is a wrought iron fence line. You cannot pass the wrought iron fence line, so you wouldn't be able to touch the abutment, but you will be able to fully circle the abutment. Got it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Shamir Barron. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the uh, changes from the 2008 proposal that indicated that the green spaces were sort of geometric, uh, more hard lined and formed, and the way that you've designed these, which are more sort of kidney or amorphic kind of shape. And the thinking there, um, if one or the other was more informed by the kind of the existing, in a sense, geometry of the place, or what, what exactly the thinking and the shift, uh, what the motivation for that was. Thank you. Thank you. I'm actually going to turn it to Paul. Paul uh, can speak the landscape better than I can. <laughs> um, it's interesting. I think that our uh, 2008 major um, idea was that visual and physical connection through here. Uh, I think the strength of the bridge pier and the bridge deck wanted to feel like the only geometric piece uh, that were there and that the landscape wanted to still allow movement around it and comfort, but uh, felt uh, more appropriate, honestly, to be something that was less geometric and more um, uh, uh, accessible and cur by by making more curves and having um, um, space in between them that wasn't uh, room like but more uh, free flowing. So the idea was to keep those visual connections across, but uh, really let the bridge. And that's why even looking at the cobbles around the base of the bridge, making that more geometric and having it feel less like it was just filling in space was a, an important move for us as well. Okay, Commissioner Jefferson. Um, yeah, I have two questions. And uh, I think the, the design of the, the, the bridge and the paving creates a room. It, it feels like you're really encapsulating the space below the bridge. So my question is whether one is, could the lighting also come from the bottom of the bridge rather than having the poles, the grid of poles? Is that a possible way of integrating the, the spatial uh, of the bridge and the paving and the lighting? Is that, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I'm making myself clear, but uh, I, that's the question. I think I understand what you're asking, uh, if, but my answer will show whether or not I understand what you're asking or not, <laughs> which is uh, we, Brooklyn Bridge Park, would not be permitted to hang anything from the Brooklyn Bridge itself. That's certainly without our, outside of our jurisdiction. Um, okay. So the lighting that we are proposing is one that lights the area both for a, a safety purpose um, as well as um, uh, to highlight the area. The lighting scheme uh, to uplight the bridge abutment itself is aimed to really provide some context and, and some grandness to the to showing the bridge abutment. Um, but you know the the paving itself, we spent a fair amount of time over the last uh, two years or so, quite honestly. Uh, really engaging in a robust community planning process. We worked very closely with Pratt uh, and David Byrne in, in that process. Um, and uh, what we came out of it was that really we heard loud and clear was that the bridge is obviously a, a very special place and that people should know that it is a very special place. And we really want to honor the bridge through this design. And the concrete pavers were if we may be so bold, we thought a really clever way of doing that um, and to mirror or mimic the, if you're standing on the pavers, look up above, really mimic what you're seeing up above. So I'm not sure if I fully answered it, but I, I think I did basically what I thought it was. Yes, yes, you did. The, right. the, the only other issue is the, you know, that's such a strong spatial statement that you're making that I, I'm wondering about the, the parts that interrupt it. I know it's aesthetic, but um, it, it, the, the aesthetic part that interrupt the pavers. Uh, 
Others, they're, they're basically seeding in one of them and the others are just kind of just planting beds. Is that it? So there, those three, those three mounds are all planting yeah. beds. None of them are publicly accessible. Um, okay. They are, they are for two reasons. Again, they're they're an aesthetic way of greening the space. You know, there was a there's a balance trying to strike, and this was also something that we heard pretty loud and clear through community planning was that there's a balance between having the space be open, um, having the space honor the bridge, and having some green. Additionally, there is that confluence of constraints, which are somewhat in conflict with each other from the Homeland Security perspective of ensuring that a car couldn't be driving down Water Street, make a right turn into the space and smack into the base of the bridge into the abutment. At the same time, the opposite of that is that DOT, on the other hand, New York City DOT, they need to be able to make a right turn off of Water Street and drive in to do maintenance on the bridge itself or on the abutment and it needed to present that opportunity. So there's a combination of hardscape and softscape to accomplish both of those needs. Um, but, uh, but there's not seeding on those, those planting beds. Those are really um, uh, just planting beds itself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lutby. Thank you. Um, I have, a, my questions are really uh, uh, relate more to the whole uh, question of like movement and circulation um, as it pertains to the planting areas. Um, Brooklyn Bridge Park is, you know, an amazing park and, and uh, it's an incredibly popular destination that, that brings a lot of people in to visit every single day. And um, I can't, I don't have a sense of what the distances are between some of these planting beds. And of course, you know, given what's going on right now in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic, I, I feel like um, it's important to, to enable people to uh, enjoy the park. You know, you were, but be able to move. So you were talking about holding areas, you know, there's a set you can move, but you also want to hold people. And I see a few areas here that, you know, make me pause if I were to walk through the, the park myself and there were a lot of people there, how would I feel right now? We don't know how long things are going on or what our lives are going to be like in the future. So for example, the area, um, a big, where the Fulton Empire Fulton Ferry Lawn is, um, there's another. There's a planting uh, bed across from it. I don't know what the the distance is there. And then we have these three pods closer to Water Street that, you know, in some areas look kind of close. And um, and then over by. Old Fulton Street, um, the air, those existing planting areas, those little three pods. I, I, I just want, I'm just trying to get a sense of what this spacing is and what the circulation would be like. Sure. Um, so let me just start very quickly and then turn it over to Paul, who um, I am very hopeful has these specific numbers for you. I, I believe he does. Um, uh, but that. So much of what we try to do is is create lots of options uh, of connectivity and and having multiple paths that, that people can choose between. Um, uh, but let me turn to Paul so that he um, I hope he knows the specifics of of the space between those paths. Um, uh, my sense is that they are bigger than they look uh, from this schematic. That that's right. Um, uh, if you look at this space between the three landforms right above the Water Street label, um, in between those plant beds are about 20 feet. So it's, you know, if you think of a normal sidewalk, even along Water Street, which we've made wider than, than, than a normal sidewalk, and even as you move over to Old Fulton uh, Street and Fulton Ferry Landing, all of those spaces um, have one per Eric's comment, which I think is a very important one, giving people different directions to move in. And we all find that now as we're moving around that, you know, when we feel like we're getting 
um, to a dead end or trapped. We, you know, that's not what we want. And I mean, and that's also just good park design where you're allowing people to move uh, in different ways and maybe not always the same. So it doesn't become monotonous. Um, so we really tried to um, allow uh, enough space around these. And, and that's for your, the reason you're mentioning, but it's also to um, respond to the scale of the bridge. I think having, you know, an eight foot wide walkway um, in between those planters would greatly be um, uh, confusing to the scale of this plaza overall um, with the bridge. So the, the intention even before the state we're in now was to have these places feel wider, still allow groups of, you know, groups of people move through here, um, tourists and all that. So I, I think that there's between 20 and 25, almost 30 feet in some places, which is the width of our promenade that runs from one end of the park to the other, um, sort of works its way through here. There are some existing pinch points by River Cafe and others, um, but everywhere where we don't have that existing dimensional restriction, we've opened it up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so not seeing any other hands raised, we'll uh, see if there is any public testimony. Um, Lisa, do we have attendees? Yes. I see a couple of hands raised. Yes, and if, if everybody could raise their hands that want to speak, but I'm going to start with the people that signed up in advance. And um, first, um, Doreen Gallo, um, I've promoted you to a panelist. Um, so if you could state your name for the record and you have three minutes. And you just need to unmute yourself too. Whoops, sorry, Doreen, that was my fault. Doreen, I think you just need to unmute yourself one more time. I apologize. Okay, back. Can, are we here? Yes. Yep, we're good. Uh, just state your name for the record and you have three minutes. Okay. Uh, my name is Doreen Gallo and I am testifying on behalf of the Brooklyn Bridge Park Community Advisory Council, the CAC, representing the Dumbo Neighborhood Alliance. Additionally, I'm the co-chair with Katrin Adam on the Design and Concessions Committee of the CAC. We understand that attempting to find commonality among 17 Brooklyn organizations within the course of a community process is daunting at best. On behalf of the CAC, we commend Paul Seck of Michael von Volkenberg for his desire and vision to reconcile some mutual goals for the site and incorporating some of our collective notes. However, with consensus, there's compromise and consensus cannot suffice for a site of this significance. We must get it right. The consequences of what is at stake may be seen as a regional matter concerning the business of Brooklyn only. The Brooklyn Bridge belongs to all of America, it is a national treasure, and we must do our part as custodians taking that responsibility to heart. Retaining the modest human scale of the neighborhood there beside the river deserves what is essential to the dignity of this majestic bridge. I would like to share some of the CAC's recommendations for your consideration. Naming, the CAC is respectfully requesting that the specified site be renamed in honor of Emily Warren Roebling with a popular suggestion being Emily Warren Roebling Square. We envision this renaming would be the only on-site tribute to her in Brooklyn Bridge Park. Naming this historical and cultural site Brooklyn Bridge Plaza seems to demean and diminish the site's significance. In addition, the riverside of the abutment is currently called the Esplanade and we encourage and support the name remain unchanged. We hope that LPC will afford every consideration in supporting these naming recommendation marking the 55th anniversary year of Landmarks Law. Uh, flooring and materials, we remain concerned about the amount of hardscape proposed, but more importantly about the materials chosen for those ground surfaces. The CAC heartily endorsed and supported design for the hardscape that MVV presented to us, 
and we approved that was oh, it was a solid wood inspired design that mirrored a grid pattern from the bridge ramparts above was functionally appropriate to connecting the ends of the park and we believe heightened the experience of the bridge we're surprised to see some substantial change to the renderings we approved a few months ago when the CRC no longer has the opportunity to discuss the park and now seeking your approval. We suggest that the concrete papers used for the design be replaced with a more substantial material such as granite rather than concrete. We appreciate the incorporation of our note to extend the design to the river side of the tower um, and the CAC uh, remains opposed to the use of asphalt as a surface in any part of this proposal. The misuse of asphalt around some of the most historic structures in the park, such as the Empire Store, shouldn't set a precedent to approve the material for its use at this site. While we are opposing the asphalt, does this not mean we are requesting Belgian blocks be used in its place? Where there is hardscape, we are just asking that the materials considered be substantially significant, such as granite, a worthy material for the excuse me, Brooklyn Bridge. While budgetary concerns may be the reason for the material choices in this proposal, it does not warrant a substantial, substandard decision. And then um, lighting. Doreen, your, your three minutes are up. Could you just please wrap up? Okay, just the lighting. We remain opposed to the telephone pole style, style of lighting in the park where the poles are situated in front of the formerly obstructed scenic views. Um, Basically, we are opposed to the lighting design completely and hope that um, something a little bit more uh, enhancing of the bridge is suitable and not adding any structural pieces. And then I have um, okay. a submission for the Dumbo Neighborhood Alliance, if that's okay. Okay, well, it's a separate, I think have you, it's, yeah, was that submitted in writing? I wasn't submitted in writing, but I signed up to speak for DNA and for the CAC. I could submit it in writing if, if that's better for you. Um, Tara, do you I, have I, a... I signed up twice, basically, for two words. Okay. <laughs> we'll allow it this time. All right. Yeah, I'll, okay. I'll be brief. Um, I guess maybe I could just summarize it. Um, so. For the lighting, we're opposed to the telephone pole style lighting throughout the park where the poles are situated in front of the formerly unobstructed scenic views of both the Manhattan and Brooklyn bridges. We oppose the addition of seven light poles under the bridge area. And while the telephone pole lighting may be suitable for recreational fields in the park, we do not agree that they're appropriate for the site. Um, and we are opposed to the harsh lights directed up towards the bridge. The lighting design proposed for the site must enhance the Brooklyn Bridge and encourage the Brooklyn Bridge and the space underneath to be illuminated in a more integrated way. Um, most of the points are very similar about the materials of the flooring. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Doreen. Okay, and then next um, person that signed up, Kelly Carroll, I'm going to move you to be a panelist. And Kelly, I you just have to unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Kelly Carroll for the Historic Districts Council. The shore that laps at and near the Brooklyn Bridge is the only part of the Brooklyn waterfront other than the Navy Yard, which is in a historic district. As the borough shoreline continues to develop as the latest trend, it is paramount to recall that this is Fulton Ferry, one of the oldest places in Brooklyn. As the designation report put it, quote, this was the place where Brooklyn began, period, unquote. It goes on to say that, quote, the transformation of the ferry village into a thriving commercial and industrial center from the 1830s on is vividly illustrated by its architecture, end quote. This architecture and era is steps away and immediately visible from what is now a park. The park, as well as the old buildings and streets that abut it are part of one historic district. They are not separate entities. It is within this context which proposed changes should be evaluated. To that end, HDC does not find concrete unit pavers and appropriate material for the design beneath the bridge. The same design can be achieved in higher quality granite pavers of differing dark and light hues. We find the abundance of asphalt to also be unfortunate 
but we understand that it proliferates in the non-designated sections of the same park and to change this material based on invisible historic district boundary lines would be more confusing than useful to the public. HDC asks the commission to look closely at the P36 light poles proposed to be installed, particularly the seven underneath the bridge. Their height, illustrated in the rendered view on the last page of the applicant's submission, shows their interruptions as they appear to soar into the bridge itself. This area beneath the bridge should be devoid of clutter. That was what the LPC decided when the agency permitted the demolition of the Streamline Modern Purchase Building, whose absence is still felt on the site, and which could have easily been adaptively reused for a park purpose. This is not just any site. This is a place where the LPC said nothing should be. Talking about the design of what goes in its place of its prime, is of primary importance. Any avoidable insertions near the Brooklyn Bridge should be doing one job, showcasing the bridge. The multitude and height of these lights has an air of surveillance. While lighting, dark, while lighting near dark water beneath a massive bridge in the evening hours is a real life safety factor, more can and should be done to conceal these fixtures in a more graceful and less obtrusive manner. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Kelly. And with that, that's everybody that signed up to speak and I don't see any other raised hands. Okay, thank you. And Rich, did, have we received any um, written testimony other than the testimony submitted by the speakers or a resolution from the community board? Yes, we have. We received seven letters in support, including from Brooklyn, Pre uh, Brooklyn Borough President uh, Eric Adams and a resolution from CB2 recommending approval. And we also received a letter in opposition from the Fulton Ferry Landing Association. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'd like to turn to the applicant team now to address some of the comments that were raised in the testimony, particularly the light pole design and the paving material. Eric, do you wanna start with that? Yeah, let me start just very briefly and then I'll hand it over to, to Paul who can speak specifically about the lighting design. Um, let me start on the Emily Roebling point. Um, uh, we've actually been having conversations with the CAC and the community at large uh, for several months and have said that we favor um, honoring Emily Roebling and naming um, the site after her and actually uh, having those discussions with the, the broader um, city, city hall and, and the mayor's office about how to appropriately do that and, and whether it's part of the mayor's She Built initiative. Um, so those conversations are, are ongoing. Brooklyn Bridge Plaza has been the I think I even I said in my my opening remarks what we have commonly referred to this for many many years, um, but uh, but that in no way, shape or form should be taken that we are not supportive of the the Emily Roebling distinction, um, and in fact have had that direct conversation with the CAC. Um, so I, I was a little surprised by that that comment, as was I that um, the implication that this design has changed since the CAC has last seen it. In fact, it has not. The only piece that has changed is. Lighting had not been fully designed when we did show it to the CAC. Uh, lighting, uh, that design got completed about a month ago, at which time it was sent to the, the CAC for their review. These are the first time that we have heard back from them on those comments. Um, uh, but I'll let Paul respond to specifically uh, how the lighting was designed and, and its intent. So um, I don't know if it's possible, Lindsay, to go back to the plan, uh, the lighting plan. Um, we, you know, as Eric mentioned previously, uh, we do need to light this area and we cannot uh, do so hanging lights from the bridge. Um, and you can see in the plan that um, it, besides the two um, poles that are really creating the uplighting um, on the abutment, um, all of the poles are tucked to the edges within plant beds, trees are going to grow up around them. Maybe we did a, maybe we, you know, a rendering showing 10 years of, or five years of growth on those trees, just like in other parts of the park, they're absorbed. Um, we did not think doing a bunch of little light poles, which would be the other option here, was a good idea because of the scale um, of the bridge and of this space and the number of, uh, small, you know, the number of smaller poles that would be needed in here would be double or triple that amount. So the idea of higher poles, lighting larger areas, um, yes, it's part of the overall um, design, but 
in, in this area, we really tried to pull them out and open up the plaza as much as possible, as you can see from the plan here. Um, the, I don't know if you want me to address the paving now as well, or if you wanted me to pause there. Okay. Yeah, please so, do. Okay, thank you. Um, the, the paving piece, although, you know, granite and other uh, materials requested would be nice. Uh, there were a couple design issues and then a couple of uh, uh, reality uh, costing issues. The, but the major point of this was that we have a granite um, and we have the Brooklyn Bridge Pier um, doing something um, that would be um, a play off of that didn't seem appropriate. Uh, something that uh, still felt rugged and industrial and not, um, you know, super clean like a granite uh, wood feel. Uh, we've, you know, tried to use a material that's the same of that. These are large um, cobble like and shape. Uh, concrete unit pavers. Uh, they are not, um, you know, things that you see um, on, uh, you know, uh, smaller plaza projects. It's meant to be rugged. It's meant to be, um, but it's meant to be something that is different. Um, but to do granite just feel, just felt off from trying to do something next to the uh, Brooklyn Bridge uh, pier. Um, and then I, I think we've already covered our reasoning for the, the asphalt moving through here. So unless there's more questions on that, um, I'll pause there. Thank you. All right, commissioners, do we have any questions? Any final questions? Okay, not, uh, I see Commissioner Shamir Barron, please go ahead. Thank you. I just wondered if there is any thought about using um, lighting in the actual where the pavers currently are. In other words, in the actual ground, uplit. Um, a couple of uh, comments on that. Um, I would have to go back and check with our lighting designers, but there were some concerns of uh, maintenance of those. Also, uh, you know, because of when this was built and because of sea level rise and all the like, our electric uh, getting up out of flood areas has been very important. Uh, so, you know, I don't, adding in uh, recessed lighting in there would probably uh, be quite a, a maintenance issue. And I've also seen that once those lights go out, they're sort of forgotten. Um, uh, so uh, the thought was to get something um, a little higher. I also think the height of the bridge and the location of that light pole to get the wash that we want needs to be a little higher so that it doesn't sort of just dwindle off onto the bottom. So um, I think there was it was more of a technical and maintenance um reality needed in order to uh, get that uh, the, to get the abutment uh, lighting to work and just to jump in for a second uh, there's also a security uh, restraint as well so uh, right. we're unable to kind of uh, install uh, flush lighting in the ground inside the dot bollards because of security reasons um, you know we can't run conduits in that area um, and so pulling, you know, in-ground lighting further and further away from the abutment just wouldn't uh, achieve that same effect. Okay, and I have a question from Commissioner Jefferson. Um, just two questions, uh, quick ones. Um, the, the lighting pole, how tall are they? Are they 30 feet or 20 feet? I, I'm not sure the height of it. That's question A. Question B is, is the, the trees in the in the perspectives, are they full grown in the perspective or half grown? What 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 age are we looking at them in the perspective? Um, so, I'll answer your second question first. Uh, those are uh, install maybe a year or two growth. Uh, a lot of times, what we will do is do another rendering that shows ten years down the line. Um, but I can guarantee that. Um, you know, if that were the case, those poles would, you know, for the most part be absorbed as we've seen happen in the other parts of the park that, you know, have been 
plant. I mean, even if you look over Eric's shoulder there on the left of his image in the in the background, there are lights within, you know, that area in there that are still doing the lighting work that are being, uh, you know, uh, um, absorbed in the planting. Um, and, and then these, what was your first question? I'm, oh, go ahead. Are they, the height of the lighting of the poles, are they 20 feet or oh. 25? 30 or what are, no they're they're awesome. they're they're 30 the ones that we're seeing here are about 35 feet in height 35 feet okay 30, thank you 35 you're welcome thank you okay any other questions okay not seeing any other questions i think we can uh, move to close the hearing and move into our discussion so uh commissioner Whoops. Okay, Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Bland, would you second that? Second. Okay. And all in favor of closing the hearing, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we're gonna move into our discussion. And so I just want to start out by giving some context and I'll give some of my thoughts off the bat and then we can um, go around. But the, um, you know, as we've heard in 2008, the commission approved the demolition of the pur former purchase building, which stood here to facilitate the creation of a park. And so the commission approved conceptually a park in this location. And um, at that time, the commission um, noted that the designation report identified a period of significance, which is unusual. Our designation reports for historic districts don't usually do that, sometimes they do. Um, and in this one, they did. They really described this district as being defined by the 19th century buildings, particularly along Old Fulton Street. And, um, and that was what, sort of the basis of the findings for the demolition of the um, purchase building, which was a 20th century building. Um, in addition, the report talks a lot about accessibility to the waterfront and the connection between the waterfront and the commercial character of and commercial activity on Old Fulton Street. And so as we think about the park design, I think that um, you know, the, this obviously was a utilitarian section previously and currently paved with asphalt, but um, and, and uh, it didn't it's, it was utilitarian and supported the bridge. Um, but I think that our findings as we think about this should think about the connectivity to the historic district as we did in the 2008 approval. So both physical and visual connections. And I think, you know, for me, I think that this um, design, you know, handles a lot of different requirements for the site, including the historic district and its relationship to the historic district very successfully. And I am persuaded that the um, organic shape of the plantings allows for a stronger appreciation of the bridge. It almost, they almost sort of read as kind of ad hoc. And then the, really the strong primary presence you read is the geometric quality of the bridge and then the paving underneath that responds to that. And I'm also persuaded by the responses to the concrete paving in that area. And I do uh, you know, agree with HTC that the asphalt relates to other sections of the park and allow for that continuity. Um, and with respect to the light poles, I think uh, in some ways, the height of the poles helps them to kind of disappear. I think if they were lower poles or more designed poles, they would actually call more attention to themselves, be less simple and maybe detract more from the bridge. So I'm also persuaded by the poles in this case as well. So I, I think this is a sensitive design that has responded to the historic district as well as many other um, requirements. And so I'm gonna uh, turn now and I'm gonna turn to Commissioner Bland, would you go next? I will, and if you'll permit me, two quick um, observations. One, I'm speaking to you from Stony Creek, Connecticut, where I have a weekend house, and all of that granite that we're looking at right now 
comes from about 400 yards from where I'm sitting from a pond that is locally known as Big Brooklyn. And this is where all that granite comes from. So it's kind of ironic that I'm sitting here listening to this. The second part of this is way back when I was simply a gadfly community activist, uh, at least a year before I joined the commission in 2008, um, I uh, got involved locally, not, uh, not at the commission level, but, but just locally um, with this whole controversy of the purchase building. And I weighed in quickly and decisively on the side of its removal. <clears throat> Although I, I love the idea of relocating it, I had just uh, a few years earlier had uh, been involved in the largest uh, moving of a building in New York in Manhattan's history, which was the Empire Theater moving down 42nd Street. So I thought it could be moved to one of the piers that it was perfectly related to a pier. But you know, this scheme is proof of how important it was to remove that building. I'm sorry for the loss of, a, of an interesting building, hardly, uh, you know, a great, great building, but an interesting building nonetheless. But this proves to me at least how important it was to remove it to allow the park uh, to continue as a park uh, on both sides of the bridge, but also it opened up extraordinary views and access to the, to the river and waterfront. So um, uh, based on now what I'm supposed to opine on, uh, I wanted to suggest that I think uh, I'm in agreement, uh, Sarah, with everything you said and almost for the same reasons that I particularly uh, appreciate the design of the, um, of the paving uh, immediately under the, uh, the carriageway of the bridge. The carriageway of the bridge is an extraordinary thing. We all focus mostly on the, the two great Gothic bulkheads, but this carriageway is extraordinary and to mimic it, so to speak, uh, right below it in this, um, in, in this striped fashion, I think was, is a brilliant move. And I don't need to repeat all the rest of it, but I'm in support of, uh, of everything as it's been presented. Okay, great, thank you. Commissioner Lutfi. Um, I also agree that, I, uh, that this has been done um, very, you know, very well. I mean, it looks, uh, look, I think the park overall is fantastic. And there's been a lot of thought and, uh, not only by the applicants and, uh, but also uh, I know there's always been uh, an active desire to get community input and into the process. And, and, you know, nothing is, we can't please everybody in terms of everything, but I think overall, this is gonna be a very, very successful plan. I would like to encourage the applicants to just take another look at some of those, some of the spacing, uh, just to make sure there's, you know, it's generous enough, because once the park's done, it's done. And, and I don't see Brooklyn Bridge Park becoming less of a destination. I think it's going to continue continue to grow in popularity <laughs> and there you know there's just a lot of people there all of the time when when the weather's nice so if you could take another look at this that that would be great and um i don't think this is under our purview but or it might be but i am also in favor of uh the naming of the plaza after uh emily warren Bogley. Okay, thank you. Not technically under our jurisdiction, but uh, I think even the applicant has said they're very supportive of that. Okay, Commissioner Jefferson. Um, I think it's a very powerful design, especially the, the space defined by the, the carriage of the bridge and the paving, very strong. I particularly like the smokestack building as a subordinate piece in the landscape and it works very well. My only comment really is the lighting poles. I wonder if, if, if they were painted black or become less powerful in the perspective somehow, be subordinate, might, might make it uh, more kind of make it less visible. Okay, thank you. 
uh, Commissioner Shamir Barron. Uh, I'm in agreement with absolutely everything that's been said. Um, the one kind of little thing that I wonder about is I, I actually think it's important to be able to understand the angle of Water Street through the uh, when you're under the when you're under the um, the bridge itself and on the new paving to understand it as being at that kind of acute angle. And I'm assuming that I mean the fact the fact the organization and pattern of the pavers allow that to be read. But I just wonder and hope that if in fact they go back and do what um, Commissioner Lutfi is proposing, which is to kind of tweak and understand the dimensions between those berms, that that there might be a, a, a view, Otter Street through them, um, that shows that expresses that angle. I just think it's important both as a definition of the district, but also um, a, a, it says something about the kind of the thrust of the bridge itself. Anyway, the project is is wonderful, and um, and I'm absolutely in support of of all the things that have been proposed. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Holford Smith. Um, I agree with the comments that have already been been stated. I think it's a it's a very successful design, mm -hmm. and I uh, I agree that the the concrete paving mimicking the carriage uh, of the bridge above is really, really nice design. Um, I want to say that when I was an architecture student at Pratt Institute in the 1980s, this was one of our project sites. And so um, it holds, it's a site that I hold dear to my heart. And I was glad that 35 years later, um, it's going to be realized in this form. Okay, great. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yes, I also agree with the comments of uh, my fellow commissioners and, uh, you know, the minor concerns I have, I feel, have been addressed by the applicant um, and I uh, fully support the project. Okay. Commissioner Goldblum? Um, I'm struggling with this one. Because, not because I think it's a, a, not a wonderful project. I think it is a, a, it's a beautiful design. It, it will result in a, an improved park that has turned out to be one of the most important public spaces in New York City. My problem with it is that I don't see how this part of the park's presence in a historic district is uh, celebrated. I, I think that the bringing down of the, of the shadow of the, of the bridge is a beautiful aesthetic uh, gesture, <laughs> but I, you know, looking back on, on the historic images, I, I looked a little bit around on what I could dig up quickly uh, on the internet. <clears throat> um, this site was always a, a jumble of industrial piers and industrial buildings um, with, with, you know, the only open spaces such as they were, were, were the piers themselves or the spaces in between them or the little edges of, of dock. <clears throat> this was a, a site that was very different. And when we look at how the commission has approved historic, um, it has approved open space modifications in historic districts like this. We, I think we always try to have some kind of echo of the real past of this particular space echoing through in some way so that a, a visitor could understand that this was different than non-historic sections of the park, it, that it had a, a relationship with the past that was complex. Um, and I just don't see that here. I don't think there's anything in a pro, you know, unpleasing or aesthetically in a, wrong about what they've done. The opposite, but I, I don't see any any gesture at all to what was actually here before. Uh, whether it's the open plaza in front of the old Fulton Ferry you know, terminal, or whether it was the industrial buildings, or the even the even the, uh, the purchase building. Oh, there, there was a history here, and I just don't see it, and so I, I'm, I'm struggling with it. I, I, I don't know what to, to really say for myself whether I'd vote for it or not, but I just don't see the history of this site here. Yeah, if I could say, I was wondering about that too. Can, would it be possible to spend a few seconds, um, Commissioner Goldblum, identifying what those might be? Because I've been struggling to identify what they would be if they or to remain or be reconstituted. I don't know what the history of the site is in that kind of granular detail. And just looking at the images that I found online, you know, there was this, 
over time, it's changed a lot. I mean, I saw I saw a photograph shortly, you know, I guess in the 19, early 1900s, uh, when, when the Victorian uh, uh, terminal building was still there. It was a jumble of, of structures with a, a tiny perimeter of, of uh, walkway space. Um, I saw another photograph that showed it as, uh, you know, kind of very similar to um, um, Williamsburg waterfront with piers, some built, some demolished and paved with asphalt. I think that it, it's had a, a history over time that's changed a lot. I mean, you look at the photograph that the applicant provides in the 1970s, I guess it is, of the, uh, 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 of the purchase building and the, and the smokestack building. It was in large measure paved uh, with asphalt. You know, I, I don't know, and if, if, our, if we're saying that the historic period of the site was the same period as the, the buildings on, on Fulton Street, um, you know, that's, I don't know, the 1870s, 1890s, uh, early 1900s. I don't know what the physical history of this site was, but I, I you know, I just, I guess I don't see it echoed in, in what's here. And I, you know, I think that um, part of what, in my mind, thinking about this is I think I focused a lot on the previous commission approval, which um, also focused a lot on the designation report. And the designation report, as it speaks to this particular section, really talks about the visual and uh, physical connection to Old Fulton Street. So allowing people to access this area, which I think this park does, and allowing you to see the waterfront, which I think this proposal does, even with the sort of ad hoc tree placement. So um, I think as a, you know, as, as it was in the designation report, it's sort of described as a utilitarian space that related to the bridge above it that I see this as doing those same things and sort of still re responding to the bridge and allowing for physical and visual access to Old Fulton Street. Uh, so that's can, I I say, yes. can I say, um, I thought the smokestack building in the presence of it is very strong and reflect back a history of the place. Great, okay, so I think, Commissioner Goldblum, you want to think a little bit more while we continue around. So I'll go to Commissioner Devonshire. Thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, I am I am filled with the memories of coming here in '79, and and we were actually. I was working in Jan's office on the Skormoharn Road building and they would take us over to this area because we were actually a, a sort of quasi and it was a jumble. And in, in general, I have long many of this area into a park. That said, the cow is out of the barn. <laughs> this is a park. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it, the, this design uh, addresses as closely as you can th those, those jumbled buildings now being history, um, a nod toward what this area was. I, I think the, the design itself is, is a bullseye. For me, the smokestack building is enough of an artifact to give the, the casual user of idea of what was going on here. I, I do have some issues with the, you know, what seemed to be here, but I think my, my misgivings were answered if, if, if they were smaller, more ob ob and objectable. So, uh, objectionable, I'm sorry what we have. I can't imagine a, a different design for the lighting that would be better than what we're being offered. So um, I, I can approve this. <clears throat> okay, thank you. And Commissioner Chen? Yeah, I agree with the, most of the commissioner's uh, comments. 
I think that um, this is now uh, into a new era where it's a park. So, <clears throat> so besides the twin stack, the really iconic uh, structure that remains is RBC, the bridge, the famous bridge. And RBC is not in our jurisdiction. I also in support of, you know, giving credit to Emily Roblin who did so much to bring this bridge into life uh, and into being here today. The one little concern I have having studied lighting um, is that I believe the weakness is in the highlighting of the abutment of the underside uh, of that uh, support of the bridge. I've, I know the difficulty of parks working with DOT always have this difficult issue of how do you mount lighting underneath it. I, I would suggest the applicant if at all possible to improve the study of that. I find that uh, maybe a better lighting, uh, a general even wash of that brick uh, abutment may be better than a harsh edge uh, twin uh, light that, you know, um, you know, what I call Nuremberg type of lighting. Um, and so I would say that if I have only one concern and one suggestion is to how to properly highlight this uh, iconic uh, bridge and especially, and that's the major lighting for the thing, because I do agree that over time, if you hide the, um, the light poles, uh, they become blended into the background. But that glaring twin lights, um, I think somehow personally, I think it could be studied. Okay. All right. And, and we, you know, as you know, we really um, uh, look at the fixtures, but we can encourage them to think about the, the wattage and the um, density of the light. So I believe that we have enough votes to approve it as is. I think that um, outside of the approval, we'd ask them to consider, you know, to continue to consider the, the quality of that lighting and um, the distancing and um, perhaps if in looking at distancing, thinking about expressing that angle of Water Street and the finish of the light poles. Um, so we'll ask them to voluntarily look at all those things, but I think we have en enough to approve it as is today. So um, Commissioner Lutfi, would you make that motion? Sure. In the matter of docket, uh, 20-09886, 11 Water Street, Brooklyn Bridge, Individual Landmark, Fulton Ferry Historic District, a park constructed from former waterfront industrial sites and from portions of the former Fulton Ferry Park. The application is to alter and expand the existing park. I know that the designation report states that the special architectural character of the Fulton Ferry Historic District is defined by the collection of mid and late 19th century buildings, which reflect the commercial development of the neighborhood when its center of activity was the Fulton Ferry and the waterfront, and that the historic district contains the last bit of actual waterfront near Brooklyn Heights, readily accessible to its residents, and that the revival and restoration of this waterfront area would provide an important amenity for the people of Brooklyn Heights and Manhattan. I also note that the site is located directly beneath the Brooklyn Tower of the individually designated Brooklyn Bridge and that the commission approved demolition of the purchase building on this site in 2008 in order to facilitate the creation of a future park with the understanding that the design of that park would be presented to the commission at a later date. I recommend approval finding that the commission's approval of the demolition of the purchase building was predicated upon the future creation of parkland in the zone that the proposed design will integrate with and provide access to the greater Fulton Ferry Park at this location and will help to unite sections of the park that remain interrupted by this empty and undeveloped space. that the alterations to the park area will make the base of the Brooklyn Bridge Tower and the waterfront more visually accessible and pedestrian friendly and will enhance the relationship between the significant buildings along Old Fulton Street and the waterfront, that the design and materials of the paving beneath the bridge span highlight and reflect the bridge grading above, creating a strong relationship between the park and the bridge, that the proposed materials and features, including salvage granite block seating and park benches, concrete pavers and asphalt paving, steel bollards and 
metal lighting poles are in keeping with the installation in Brooklyn Bridge Park and complement the district's industrial character. And that the cumulative effect of this proposal will enhance the special architectural and historic character of the full very historic district. Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. Okay, Rich, will you call the vote? Yes, and just before uh, we continue, I just want to know for the record that Commissioner Gustafson has entered the meeting. Okay, Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. No. Oh. Commissioner Gustafson. Abstain. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. Okay, with nine in favor, one opposed, and one abstain, the motion carries. Okay, thank you. So that's approved. And good luck to you. And we'll um, move on. And I think what we'll do is we'll take a two minute break um, before we set up the next item. And we're a little behind schedule, so we won't go for long, but just um, give everyone a chance to stretch their legs for a minute. So if ever, all commissioners, if you can just turn your camera and um, volume off, and then when you return, turn your camera back on, we'll know you're here. Thank you. Okay, so I think that we have six of us back, seven of us back. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven of us back. Um, and we should probably get on schedule, so. Okay, um, we're gonna start back up with item number three. This is LPC 20-08748, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1297, lot 23. 405 Lexington Avenue, the Chrysler Building Individual and Interior Landmark. An Art Deco style skyscraper designed by William Van Allen and built in 1928 to 1930. The application is to replace windows and install glass windscreen. Commissioners, the applicants have joined the hearing. Um, you may state your name for the record and begin. Sheldon Werdiger of RFR begin this discussion. I'm not sure if Sheldon, are you able to uh, unmute? Uh, yes, I can. Ah, terrific. Hey, great. My name's Sheldon Werdiger, and I'm head of design and development for RFR in New York. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, first, I want to commend you for maintaining the continuity of the landmark review process during this unusual moment. Uh, we all appreciate this as applicants. Uh, you may say that there's a historical coincidence regarding the Chrysler building at this time. The building was originally constructed and completed in 1930 during the Great Depression and has rem remained the crown jewel in the city's skyline since. Now we come to you with the same optimism and enthusiasm to keep this building relevant into the future during what we can say is our own current depression. Conceived as part of his original vision, uh, William Van Allen, the Chrysler Building's architect, uh, had designed on the 66 to 67 floors uh, what was originally the Cloud Club, which at that time was the world's highest lunch club. The club catered to corporate executives and closed its doors in 1979. We at RFR have made a commitment to bring back this bar lounge namesake and legacy to the building. Uh, instead, to put it on the 61st and 62nd floors to take advantage of the two extraordinary terraces on the north and south sides, which have unobstructed obstructed city views uh, and are within touching distance of the beautiful Art Deco eagles that perch on that level. Our application to you requests approval of a couple design elements that we feel have no visual impact from the street 
but has enormous impact on the viability and enjoyment in the new space from within. So with that, uh, I leave it to my colleagues to make our presentation. Great, thank you, Sheldon. Uh, You're welcome, Cass. Cass Stackelberg, Higgins, Grace Barth, and Partners. Um, I'll be brief, and, and Leslie Jabs of Gensler will take you through the design presentation, but um, as Sheldon mentioned, obviously the, the project site is the Chrysler Building, uh, perhaps one of New York's most iconic landmarks, um, located on Lexington Avenue between 42nd and 43rd Street, completed in 19. 30, it was designated as an individual landmark in 1978, uh, along with its uh, remarkable interior lobby. Um, the scope of work that we're going to be sharing with you today uh, really involves three component parts, uh, all of which, as Sheldon said, are occurring at the 61st and 62nd floor. I'm just highlighting those areas um, on the cursor here. Um, there are three components. Um, we are proposing to install uh, glass panels uh, on the south and north terraces uh, at the 61st floor. These are um, clear glass panels, cantilevered right off the roof decks. Um, along with that are modifications to existing terrace, door, uh, terrace doors on those two terraces. Um, and this modification is associated with making these terraces accessible, uh, which they are currently uh, not. And then the third component is removing the existing windows on the 61st and 62nd floor and replacing the one over one double hung windows with single light windows, um, obviously associated with the new occupancy at those levels. Um, our, um, our, our thinking um, in terms of the appropriateness of these modifications, I think can be um, considered in three different, uh, three different ways. One, uh, particularly in relation to, um, to the windows, uh, the Windows that we'll be removing are, as I said, one over one aluminum windows. They were replaced in the last few years um, as, as part of um, upgrades to the building. So these are not historic, uh, historic windows. Um, as well, um, I think what's very significant, you can see it in this photograph here, is that the architectural reading of the building um, as a Art Deco um, modern structure, um, the composition of these elevations of the building are very different than a typical building with just punched openings. Van Allen clearly was looking to use the windows as part of an integral uh, composition. And the individual reading of the windows we think are less important than a building of this type. Uh, and then particularly the configuration, the simple one over one window. Um, this was not intended to be a multi-light sort of um, uh, uh, backward looking, historic looking uh, window configuration, but one instead that was very much forward looking. Um, so we think the modification to the windows in that regard will be uh, will have really no effect uh, on the architectural reading of the building. And then lastly, in terms of perception, uh, the work, and you'll see this from photographs from the street, the work that we're proposing on the 61st and 62nd floor really is not, it, it, while it is visible uh, supposedly from the street at about 600 feet, it really is imperceptible. Uh, we're not removing historic fabric and the modest uh, changes at those levels really will not have any effect on the architectural character of this remarkable building. Um, Leslie. Yes. So we will go through very quickly as we know that your time um, has been challenged with the previous hearing. Here we see the existing and the proposed modifications that show and indicate the locations for the proposed terraces on the north and the south side. We would note here, although we'll get into it later, that the reasoning for the terrace screen to be held back on the east and the west ends is to allow for servicing of the eagle gargoyles for relamping and also just to service them. Whereas the depth of the terrace is so limited that we wanted to maximize the depth, which really is only effectively a little over six feet. On the 62nd floor, we are proposing only the replacement, as Cass mentioned, of the existing replacement windows. You will see in the details that the framing in that matches almost identically to these approved windows. The view impact, we're only going to look at a couple of these slides. There were a full set included for your reference, but we only want to highlight a few of them where we see the mock-up. So if we look at the first one, what we can see here looking from 
40th Street from the south for two blocks away, where the red arrow is in the upper right is where the visual mock-up. Please note for this mock-up that it was actually done with wood framing and also does have a line that has been painted orange that connects it across the face. As you can see, even on the enlargement, it is barely perceptible. Certainly from the street, it is not perceptible at all. As we quickly go through the next views, again, uh, the mock-ups are there, they're not noticeable. And the windows, of course, we cannot replicate as a mock-up. Again, from here, Tudor City, this is a very open view from the east, but this is just not particularly visual. Probably the North Terrace is where you can see, and again, that wood framing is only for the mock-up, and that does not represent what the pure glass screen will look like. Continue from the, you know, from the west looking back, again, the mock-up is just not visually impactful in any way. So then we can move along now to going through some of the detailing after we finish with these. Uh, the impact study uh, basically are about a block away before you will see the tops of the screen. Uh, closer than that, it will not be visible with the cutoff from the parapet wall. The glass screen itself, when we look at the 2D elevations, we have aligned the top of the proposed glass screen with the primary masonry openings. So there is a visual cue that aligns this important um, sight line. Here, when we look again, we would point out here the, the new glass screen will not touch the primary facade of the building at all. There will be a gap that will occur between the building and the ending of any of the trims of the screen itself. Here we see the section. As you can see currently, the existing pipe rail which is not part of the designation of uh, the, the Nerosta steel cap that resides on top of the coping will not be touched as part of the installation, but we do need to remove the code non-compliant pipe rail. The back of the parapet wall will be properly treated and remediated and closed off from these openings. The new glass screen itself Oh, sorry, I can't back. Uh, there will be structural steel plating that goes down to the existing structure that will allow for us to do the full eight foot cantilever without any vertical, visible vertical supports whatsoever that reside above the height of the parapet. We then cover this structural steel with a new stainless steel trim it will allow us to have a clean, clear view. Again, the Nerosta steel coping will actually be slightly taller than this so that that feature is still visible from both inside and is not disrupted from outside. The east-west section, the only difference here is that we see the clear aisleway that will allow maintenance to be able to access the gargoyles. The new safety tie-off will be achieved with a cable that will be at the, the floor level. So the safety of the workmen are there, but there will be nothing that protrudes above the finished roof level. Here again, you can see the reason for our maintenance that's required. There are the gargoyles, there's the exterior building lighting, and again, we actually think the building is enhanced by the removal of the existing pipe rail. The existing sliding doors of which um, there has not been a historical track of these, they clearly upon inspection are not original. They are aluminum and glass. And the current width of that opening is only five foot, zero and one half inch, which does not allow us to actually have a code compliant door. 
for the purpose of occupying the terrace. We have proposed to put in a new pair of sliding doors where one leaf will be wider than the other to allow both for legal egress from the terrace and also for ADA access to the terrace. This will be accomplished by creating a pocket behind the masonry for the wider glass to slide into. That detail was shown in the appendix. Here we show both the masonry window replacement and the Neurosta steel on the next slide to go from the double hung to the single light. As you can see, we have been able to source detailing that will allow us to match the frame locations from the face of masonry to the existing trims, the existing lintels, and the profiles themselves will almost be identical to what is existing today. The glass will be the same glass that has been approved uh, within, luckily because this was a recent renovation, we can still get the exact same glass and coating. So visually the appearance of the glass will be identical to what you see today. Again, here's the detail for the Neurosta steel. We are able because of the trims not to have to touch the existing Neurosta steel in order to install these new windows, thus preserving it uh, without any risk to damage. And again, the glass will match exactly to what is there today. I believe that is what we have to share with you. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Feel free to raise your hands if you have any questions. Okay, not seeing any questions at this time. We'll see if there's any public testimony. Anyone who would like to speak, please raise your hand and we'll admit you. And Lisa, will you? Okay, and we had um, Kelly Carroll signed up to speak and has raised her hand. So Kelly, um, I've, I'm muting you. Okay, Kelly Carroll, Historic Districts Council. HDC has no objections to the proposed. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll start over. HDC has no objections to the proposed window replacement as this modest change at the 61st and 62nd floors will be imperceptible from the street. The proposed window screens are necessary for public's visits and have precedent atop Manhattan's iconic skyscrapers. HDC noticed that low reflective glass will be employed for the windscreen, but is it possible to install a mock-up panel to measure the true glare of the sun? The Chrysler Building is arguably the most iconic Art Deco skyscraper in New York, only second to the Empire State Building. Our committee would like to ensure that the glimmer of the proposed screen does not outshine the Neurosta steel for which this building is known and loved. Thank you. Great, thank you, Kelly. Um, and Kelly was the only person signed up to speak and the only person I see that has um, put her hand up. Okay, thank you. And um, Rich, do we have any written testimony? We just have a resolution from Manhattan Community Board 6 recommending approval. Okay, thank you. All right, and um, we have a question from Commissioner Shamir Barron, and then after that, I'd like to see if the app, if we have other questions or if the applicants have any final uh, comments, particularly on the glare of the um, pa glass panels. Um, and whether a mock-up was done, but we know a similar installation is was approved at top of the rock, and maybe you can talk about the comparison to that. Okay, Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes, I just have a quick question about the length of the glass uh, windscreen and what the reason is for extending it that extra five foot eight on either sort of side. It, uh, if, if there was consideration of pulling it back um, to the actual width of that flat face uh, on 43rd Street? Yes, happy to answer that question. Um, 
I wish that we weren't in the COVID uh, era as the commissioners would have had their opportunity for a site visit and hopefully they will have. To actually see the gargoyles and see them up close is really, um, it's really thrilling. I have to be honest, the condition of them is excellent. Uh, all these years, they haven't been open to public view. And we really wanted to extend the screen to allow the visitor to get as close to them as possible while still acknowledging uh, the maintenance requirements, the long term facade. Uh, maintenance requirements that for rigging and scaffolding, et cetera, that we had to leave this, this aisle to the ends. So we certainly did think about it uh, and it really was done. And, and I hope all of you will have an opportunity to come and see the terrace, but getting as close to them as possible is, is just really exciting. And I, I think the public would truly enjoy, I know five feet doesn't maybe sound like a lot, but as you can see, it just gets you a lot closer to that corner. And it, it, as you know, that's a very celebrated feature of this building. Okay, thank you. And do you wanna to respond to the uh, public comments about the, the type of glass? Yes, absolutely. We have done extensive studies, uh, have looked at a selection actually of eight different glass types that run the gamut for low reflectivity. The glass, we're down to a selection of two different options and a couple of them might because of COVID rely upon availability in that. But these have significantly and extremely low reflectivity. It will also be applied on both sides of the glass. So one of the benefits that we will have is that we won't be getting any flashback from either side of the glass because both sides will be reflective. The mock-up samples are two by two samples, uh, which are good sized. Uh, it is something where I don't know that a full size panel mounted on the 61st floor, I'm, I'm not sure that it would achieve what has been asked, but it is certainly something that could be considered and of course, uh, happy to supply real samples. As you know, that can be an extremely difficult test uh, as the sun changes all day, it changes all year, we're on different facades, uh, but we believe that the reflectivity is so much lower. And I will confirm the actual glass. I believe Pilkington is what was used at the Rock Center. I will check that, uh, but our glass actually should be a lower reflectivity than that glass. But we will have to come back and confirm that for you. Okay. Other questions? Okay, not seeing any other questions. I think we can um, move to our discussion and um, Commissioner Bland, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Lutfi, would you second that? Second. Okay. All in favor of closing the hearing? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. We're going to, hearing is closed and we're going to move into our discussion. And um, this is for both the, the glass railing as well as for the window changes at the <coughs> You know, very minimally perceptible, if at all, um, but it also includes the, the windows above. So um, let's, why don't we start with uh, C Commissioner Shamir Barron, since you had a question, we'll start with you. Thank you. Um, very exciting to see this project. As um, former director of the Van Allen Institute, I'm very familiar <laughs> with this place and uh, visited several times kind of in search of the, of the original club um, what I was struck with when I, when I was there uh, uh, in my several visits were, was the experience of this, um, of 45 degree or whatever the exact degree is, angles. Um, we, we don't think about it that way, but I was struck by it in, in several cases, both in the lobby, but also upstairs. And 
and the relationship, you know, there are some uh, through the kind of the chamfered and in some cases triangulated window openings, there is this kind of diagonal. And so I, I'm just wondering if there's a possibility to actually experiment a bit more with this uh, glass windscreen and maybe even make that corner, you know, the, the, uh, the line, the edge, instead of five foot eight, kind of cut it on the diagonal or have it turn the corner, something so that we really, the geometry that they've proposed there is just a little bit off in terms of that five foot eight protrusion. But otherwise, this is a, a, a wonderful project and, um, and it'll be great to have it come back. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Commissioner Gustafson. Uh, well, uh, sp speaking as someone who spent nine years in the one of the ugliest buildings in Manhattan, which happens to be right next door to the Chrysler at 425 Lexington, I had an office window that stared at the 30th floor level of the Chrysler building for nine years of seven days a week, 24 hours a day of law firm work. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was indeed the most exciting thing there was in my life. Um, and, uh, and, uh, I was staring at the, uh, the radiator caps at the 30th um, floor. So I'm, I'm kind of surprised that the applicant got through this whole thing without referring to the Eagles as hood ornaments, but, um, uh, that's forgivable. Um, but it, what it does tell me is that, uh, my experience of the building from that height tells you that there, you know, before I saw that from that level, I was even unaware of the um, uh, the radiator caps, so you really cannot see um, uh, even even at the thirtieth floor, let alone what's going on at the um, um, at the sixtieth uh, floor and above. So um, when we say that this is um, barely visible, I mean it is. Um, you'd have to have incredible vision to be able to see any of these changes. So the reflectivity obviously is the only issue that, of any significance whatsoever, and I'm sure they're going to pursue that. Um, so um, I think it's uh, completely appropriate and. Uh, and uh, we'll continue to outshine that piece of junk next door to it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Jefferson. <laughs> I, I think it's appropriate. I, I'm concerned about the, the angles, but I don't think I have a solution for it. So I think it's appropriate. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lutfi. I think it's appropriate. One of my favorite buildings in the city. Okay, Commissioner Bland. Uh, similarly, I think it's appropriate. Okay, Commissioner Chen. Um, yes, I agree with uh, the comment, and I only wish that uh, we we have uh, allowed the site visit. I know, but well, maybe we can still plan a site visit at some day. <laughs> Commissioner Devonshire. I think it's appropriate. Okay, Commissioner Goldblum. Agreed. And Commissioner Chapin. Yeah, this is my number one favorite uh, landmark and uh, I do support the application. Okay, and Commissioner Holford-Smith. I agree, it's appropriate. Okay, great. So I think we have a unanimous approval here. I also agree this is one of my favorite landmarks as well. Um, so I will go ahead and make this motion. Um, and this is an application for a certificate of appropriateness, docket number LPC 20087484405 Lexington Avenue, the Chrysler Building, an individual and interior landmark, an Art Deco style skyscraper designed by William Van Allen and built in 1928 to 1930. This is an application to replace windows and install glass windscreens. I recommend approval finding that the proposed glass windscreens at the 61st floor terraces will be consistent with similar installations at other tall buildings with observation decks, will be simply designed and will not damage or obscure any significant architectural features, that the windscreens will only be seen from public thoroughfares at great distance and height and will feature a non-reflective coating further helping them to recede from view that the upper portions of the terrace doors and windows facing the terrace windscreen enclosures at the 61st uh, street, 61st floor will only be partially visible at a great distance and height, and that the windows at the 62nd, uh, 62nd floor will also be uh, minimally perceptible. And, um, the, and the change in configuration of these windows will be discreet and will not otherwise interrupt um, uniform fenestration pattern and, the, and uh, therefore recommend approval. 
Arts, uh, Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you second that? Second. All right, Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. Okay, 11 in favor, none opposed, and motion carries. Okay, thank you. And we have one more item before we break for lunch. Okay, and that item is number four, uh, LPC 20-08588, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1124, lot 42, 12 West 72nd Street in the Upper West Side Central Park West Historic District, an apartment hotel building designed by Emery Roth and built in 1927. The application is to install new window and door openings. And commissioners, the applicants have joined the hearing. Um, state your name for the record and you may begin. My name is Michael Ingui from Baxter Ingui Architects. Um, good afternoon, uh, commissioners. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for uh, continuing with the hearings. Uh, this is uh, this has been very helpful. <coughs> Um, as you can see, um, the, the project that we're working on is on the 28th, uh, 27th, 28th, and 29th floors. And we are uh, going to be installing new windows and door openings on the 28th and 29th floors on the east facade of the building. Um, we're replacing them, or we're putting uh, in two over two double hung cottage style windows that follow the building's master plan that was previously approved by LPC. Um, if you look at the facade, which is, e it's easier to see this in the drawing than it is the photos, there's already what looks kind of like a blind window to a certain extent. There's brickwork already in place of where these windows would be. Um, windows at the, on the top and doors on the bottom. The other thing I would say is as we, as we look at the rest of the building, the penthouse on the other side of this tower has already done this and has openings that we are now creating the, the, the penthouse on the uh, on the west facade. Um, the openings are minimally visible from the street. Um, I think the next slide to show just what the visibility is. Um, so Michael, you can just uh, click on the presentation to great. have remote control of the screen. Oh, great, thanks. Oops, whoa. <laughs> It went way too fast. Um, so, um, so wow! Well, right, I got it now. So, um, when you when you take a look at the photo here, this is taken from the corner um, at Central Park at Seventy Second and Central Park, and you can see even with a pretty heavy zoom, you're able to see the upper uh, floor windows, but not the doors. <clears throat> but really, it's imperceptible from there. We we're actually able to show the penthouse on the west side in this photo, and you can barely see their windows and doors as well, but you can kind of see them. And then we also went all the way across the park. And again, you'd have to have binoculars to see this, but it is a public way. So it, it's really not easily seen uh, from a public way, but we, we did want to describe it. When we put the windows and doors in, we will not be, um, removing any of the brick that surrounds it, that, that core rolling that's at the top um, and at the bottom, creating the, the head and sill. We're able to work within the window opening with um, typical materials that could be installed from the interior, which is just an L galvanized uh, member of steel and um, we can waterproof it appropriately. I'm gonna go back to this view which kind of brings us back. So again, it's it's the two windows at this location and the two doors at this location. Thank you. All right, thank you. Commissioners, do we have any questions? All right, not hearing any questions. We'll see if there's anyone um, who would like to speak and speakers should raise their hands at this point and we'll recognize you. Um, Lisa, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Um... Yes, we have Mark Diller, who I just promoted to a panelist. Um, and I'm unmuting. 
And Mark, if you could just state your name for the record and you have three minutes and I'm also asking you to start your video if you like. Start my video, I'm sorry. You're good, you may well, start. You... Thank you. Yeah. So this is, I'm Mark Diller. I'm the chair of community board seven in which this application sits. I am grateful to the commission for the opportunity to testify. I'm grateful to the applicant um, for bringing this to our attention. This is one of the first applications that we heard when posting for community um, awareness of an application became compromised because of COVID. Um, and so we are glad that we didn't hold anything up for that, but we are glad that uh, they were able to come to us. Um, with respect to the um, application, our resolution is uh, in favor. Um, there were 37 votes in favor and only two abstentions, none opposed. Um, we were particularly moved by the fact that the windows and doors would fit into existing corbeling and brickwork that make their uh, presence actually feel appropriate and, and, and um, uh, more expected of what that facade should look like than the current condition, truthfully. Um, the, um, and the, using, the use of the um, <clears throat> master plan um, window design uh, fits perfectly into this uh, scenario here. Um, in terms of visibility, it is visible. We don't discount the fact that it is um, the 27th floor of a building, um, but it is certainly minimally visible. Um, but measured on its own, even if we're on the first floor, uh, our, our, our view was that because of the nature of the placement of the windows and the window configurations themselves, that this would be appropriate um, uh, at any level of this uh, of this iconic building, not not as iconic as the last building that you guys were just talking about, but um, but this is an important building on our Upper West Side. We take it quite seriously, and we're happy to recommend approval. Thank you very much. Great. Thank, Thank you. you, Mark. Okay, um, and then the next person that signed up and also has their hand raised is Landmark Wet West. This is Sean. Um, and I've unmuted you, and if you'd like to run your video, you can do that as well. Please just state your name for the record, and you have three minutes. Sure. Good afternoon, Commissioner Sean Corsandi for Landmark West. The Landmark West Certificate of Appropriateness Committee recognizes that this was not originally designed as a living space, and alterations to the lantern have already been executed on the west-facing apartment. We appreciate the applicant's intentions for a complementary scent of masonry openings in a mirror pattern. The committee understands that these follow the master plan and hope the window configurations of the existing sister apartment in 27A someday follow suit for a cohesive lantern. The Landmark West Certificate of Appropriateness Committee supports approval of this application. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sean. And um, I believe that is everybody um, that's signed up and has their hand raised to testify. Okay, and Rich, do we have a resolution from the CB? Yes, we do. Um, it recommended approval, as Mark Diller had said, and oh, yes, uh, of course. we also have a letter from Landmark West, as has already been discussed. Okay, so the two letters we received are were represented by speakers today. Okay, great. Um, so I think that was very positive testimony. I'm not sure the applicants want to add anything at this time, but this would be your final moment to add anything before we move to discussion. Nothing to add at this time. Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, so let's uh, make a, a motion to close the hearing and um, move into our discussion. Commissioner Bland, would you make that motion? I moved. Commissioner Gustafson, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor of closing the hearing? Aye. 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 <laughs> Any opposed? Okay, so. Um, we'll move into our discussion. The hearing is closed. Um, this is similar to our previous applications, uh, another window changes that are at a, a very high location, sort of an iconic top of this building, um, fitting within openings oh, and relating to other openings on the um, facade. So would anyone like to start with this? Commissioner Devonshire, would you like to start? Sorry, Sarah, did you call me? Yes. I, I couldn't hear the, it's still cutting out. 
I'm I'm totally in favor of this. I think it's appropriate. Okay, great. And uh, Commissioner Chen. Likewise, yeah. Commissioner Likewise. Bland. Yes, and because it fits in with the uh, carbling of the current brick, it's very appropriate. Okay, Commissioner Lutfi. Agree, appropriate, good job. Okay, uh, Commissioner Jefferson. Um, where am I? Um, I find this proposal appropriate. It keeps the character and work within the center bay and the existing facade composition. Great, and uh, Commissioner Gustafson. Appropriate. Um, Commissioner Shamir Barron? Yes, I think it's appropriate as well. Okay, Commissioner Holford Smith? I agree, I think it's appropriate. And Commissioner Chapin? I agree. All right, and Commissioner Goldblum? Agree. Okay, great. And, and I also did want to just comment that I think relating to the master plan, having the configuration relate to the master plan will also help to strengthen this building's uh, fenestration pattern. Okay, so I think we're ready to go ahead and vote on this. So, um, Commissioner Holford Smith, would you make this motion? Yes. Uh, in the matter of LPC 20-08588. 12 West 72nd Street, apartment 27B in the Upper West Side, Central Park West Historic District. Uh, an apartment building designed by Emory, Emory Roth and built in 1927. The application is to install new window and door openings. I note that the building's style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Upper West Side, Central Park West Historic District. I recommend approval, finding that their proposed openings at the east facade of the tower will be in keeping with the building's historic fenestration pattern and will match similar alterations that have occurred over time at the west facade of the tower. That the proposed multi-light French doors will be consistent with other terrace doors on the building and the windows will match the configuration, materials and details of windows approved under the existing master plan for window replacement and that the work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the building or the Upper West Side, Sumter Park West Historic District. Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. Okay. Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Mm -hmm. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. <laughs> Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. Okay, 11 in favor, none opposed, the motion carries. Okay, so that's approved, thank you. And we're now gonna break for lunch and we'll come back at 1.15 for our afternoon session. So commissioners just turn your uh, cameras off and your sound off and we'll see